United States, uh, they don't understand how religious the United States actually is. Like, they don't, they, um, like, when you drive across the border to Canada, there is nothing here. Like, you turn on the radio station, there isn't a Christian radio station. Like, when, when we drive across the border down into the States, uh, my wife, Ashley, she's always like, wow, look at all these Christian stations. This is crazy. And uh, you'll see some Christian signs. You just don't you just don't get that in Europe or in Canada. Um, people don't uh, I think people in America take take that for granted. I don't think they realize just how um, how strong the Presbyterianism uh, in particular faith is still in the United States like the the especially when you get out of the big cities and you start getting into the countryside like um, it's, it, it, people yeah. people still have faith here there's still churches uh, in, in Canada it's just it's just not the case there's I mean the missionaries back when we first moved here in Winnipeg they'd share some some stuff that you know they were given as a, as a mission and it was crazy I mean it was like like something like 70 percent or something like that of canadians uh, identified as nothing like they it, it was some huge number and it was like more than double um wow. what it was in the united states and it was like that is crazy just driving across the border um uh, the spirituality is just cut in half but um and people uh you know what will obviously be quick to say that's very similar in europe that that people just aren't religious anymore a lot of them will say that they're Catholic, but they don't obviously go. Right. That was like my Italian family. Huh. Oh, we're all Catholic. What do you attribute that to? I mean, is it, is it is it really just you know like the Constitution, religious freedom kind of thing, or 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 what? Um, I I think that I think it has a a little bit to do with what Orson. Not Orson. Now I don't know. Parley P. Pratt or Orson. I get the Pratts mixed up. Uh, especially since uh, the number of quotes from those two just seems to grow and grow. I, I don't know where we'd be as a church, as a church right now with without their writing. But when when uh, th they talk about how the 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 light will start in the center in in uh, in um, church head, church headquarters and then it will spread throughout the world. And, and I wonder how much of that that is the case where yeah. the Lord, especially early on, even if we, we like to talk about how, you know, there was thousands of people baptized and then they came over here um, uh, as, you know, Latter-day Saints. But I think the Lord was doing this long before he sent off missionaries. I, I think that like the, the Puritans and, and such, I, I think that some of the best blood on the planet was being gathered here at that time. And, um, you know, that, that's just my thought process. And, and, and so I, I think that there's a lot of it being that, that there's just a, a lot of, of people that, that have those similar characteristics that got brought to this, this location at this time. It doesn't mean they're not throwing it in the trash right now, but, um, yeah. There's some, you know, some funny, there's some funny um, commentators, I don't know what you would call them, that uh, that talk politics and stuff that are from England that I like listening to. You know, uh, I've, I've shared some Paul Joseph Watson before. And, uh, you know, there was another guy that a lot of people liked named Milo. And uh, what they what they said is that um, it felt like America took some of the best blood that Europe that that England had like that was just the the concept was is that those that just wanted freedom left and, and the rest of the people just stayed behind and so I uh, and I, I don't know how much that's true but it sure feels like that's the case it's just it's so nice to drive across the board in the United States flip on a radio station and just be like Man, there's Christian there's Christian stations again, and here's the other thing: country music. I don't like country music. I can't I can't really stand it, but man, man, they still have their uh, Christian roots. Like uh, it's 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 and stuff yeah. like, stuff like that is just 
I, I think that when you're an, a, a Latter Day Saint and you're uh, in the United States and you constantly have to battle, in some cases, other Christian denominations, you kind of take them for granted. Where it's like, I, I'd rather be battling with another Christian denomination than an agnostic or, or like an, an an atheist. Like it's just, uh, it's so nice to have somebody that has some sort of faith. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a blessing. I I, I just. It's like raise the level of conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can have something to talk about. Like we can, we can have something to talk about. You know that that where I, I I've said this often for missionaries. If Jesus or or God came into the room right now and said, "Hey, do 10, 10 jumping jacks," would you do it? And in the United States, I I would say maybe I don't know one out of every three or maybe one out of every two fifty percent of people would say, "Oh yeah, absolutely." Um, I found in Canada, yeah. I found in Canada that the, it is so small, so small, that there'll be people that will, will, I'll be talking to with the missionaries, and, and they'll do that, and they'll say no before the question's even finished. It, it, it'll be what? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kid you not. Yes, they'll, so I'll they'll say they'll be working through it. So so if God came into the room and He was here and He was talking to you and He said, John, will you? And then they, he just went, no. And it was, it was like, oh, I didn't even finish, I didn't even finish the sentence. And, and you're already like, no, if, even if God showed up and told me to do something, no, no, I don't, because I don't believe in him, no. And, uh, yeah, that's, it's something very unique. Something very unique. So the, the biggest problem in Canada right now isn't the burning down of the churches. It's the fact that the grand majority of Canadians don't care. Like that, that's an even bigger problem. Like yeah. if churches were being bur bur burned down in the countryside in America, there'd be people that would care. And, uh, there, there would be some pushback, but, uh, in Canada, when I'm looking online, man, uh, there is, um, it just, uh, it's not here. So anyway, welcome everyone. Somebody says, hi, Ashley. And you're saying he's spicy. I don't get it. Did I do something wrong? I think they were talking about Discord was spicy. Andy said lots of spicy in Discord. Oh, I didn't. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, Andy, my man. I I just said before I got in here, I said, I really need a fireside where I can talk about something else. And then uh, Andy comes in and throws salt in my eye. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, Andy, I love you so much. Um, <laughs> thank you all. We're welcome to come, uh, or we're welcome you here to a fireside. This is going to be a really uh, cool one because we have uh, Blake, uh, also known as Defending Zion. Uh, we'll, we'll let him introduce himself because I always like I always like to do that. Um, but we also are going to be going over the second half of, of Lecture on Faith 3, which I love these lectures on faith. And the second half of lecture on faith three is really important. And we also, or Blake specifically, uh, will be going over something in the Q and a, which I think a lot of people will find very interesting. So, uh, Blake has not shared. Are we, wait, are we still doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm ready for it. If okay. You are. He is. Okay. Go. Um, so he has not shared that with me. So it'll be a, um, surprise for all of us it'll be uh so he'll be uh he'll be letting us know um the results and and what he's been getting with the feedback as far as that uh survey dealing with the dream so this is gonna be a really uh fun fireside i'm looking forward to it um i'll start with a prayer and then we'll we'll let uh, uh, uh blake introduce himself again and then we will uh go from there so father in heaven we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for our many blessings. We're thankful for the Sabbath, which day thou has given to us to rest from our labors and to remember thy son, Jesus Christ, and remember remember thee, Father, and remember the sacrifices and the love that thou was shown for us. We pray, Father, at this time that the technology that we are using will hold and that we'll be able to converse one with another through all the different parts of the, the world uh, in love and gratitude for thee and thy gospel. We pray for thy spirit, Father, to help us to speak thy words and understand thy will and not our own. Pray, Father, that the all the um, 
contention, the problems in the world that, uh, and uh, the, the problems that are coming. Father, we pray for a way that to escape these uh, many desolations that are coming. We pray for deliverance from these things. We love thee, Father, and we're grateful for thee, and we pray for thy spirit to attend us today, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll let uh, Blake, a.k.a. Defending Zion, introduce himself. All right. Um, so, for I mean, there's a lot of you that already know me, but uh, for those of you that don't or, or maybe are just coming on to, to Micah's channel or uh, coming on to the Discord, um, my name is Blake. I have... I was born and, and raised in Idaho, and I've also had my life take me to um, the D.C. area, Washington, D.C., uh, to Northern California. Um, I served my mission in New Zealand, uh, Mandarin speaking, and we're back in Idaho. And um, Everywhere I've lived, you know, there, it's been special. But there's there's a pull that I've felt to to Idaho and and to this area, and I think probably a lot of people can can relate to that. Um, and I, I think that you know, as we get into these discussions about what's happening in the last days and and what you know what is to come. Um, I think we, we like familiarity. Uh, we like to be able to to be in a familiar place with familiar people uh, doing things that we were used to doing. And especially last night, I had the opportunity to go to the temple for the first time since you know COVID. And that feeling of familiarity was really something that hit me hard it was going back to the temple was like seeing an old friend again and that spirit i realized that even though like i physically haven't set foot in the temple for over a year that that spirit that that, that friendship with christ has continued it, it, it didn't stop with covid it's continued and i hope that all of you have had that experience as well where you where you feel like the savior has been there with you and and that there hasn't been a letdown necessarily in in your spiritual practices or in you feeling the spirit or feeling the power of your covenants and so that's just something i noticed that 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 i share um with you tonight kind of as we get started and as we talk about um lectures on faith and talk about the characteristics of God, um, a lot of these principles are going to feel familiar to us because we see them in so many areas. And it's, you know, it really is our spirits um, that have been taught these things that hang on to that, that we're remembering again. So, and then particularly as we talk late, later on in the fireside about dreams, um, that's also going to be something that's going to play a huge part in trying to unpack these dreams and, and why why we're having them. So, I don't know if that's the introduction you wanted, but that's that's what I got. Uh, it sounded good to me. Um, I did not have uh, – <laughs> there was nothing uh, planned there, so that, that was perfect. I love the uh, – I love the reference to the the temple and familiarity. I uh, I uh, we can't wait to get back. We can't even uh, in Ontario, Canada, like I've said, we can't even get back to our building yet. So um, <clears throat> yeah, the rest of the world's like, yeah, we're going back to temples, and we're like, uh, we might go back to church soon. Um, so <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I it's amazing. I have no idea how how they've managed to do this for so long here in, in Ontario, but. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to be going over the, the second half of lecture number three, lecture uh, lectures on faith. Uh, we went over the other half on another fireside. Um, as always, you can find the lectures uh, for free on our family website, but you can also find them free on um, 
multiple locations. So they're, they're not hard to find online in a PDF form for free. Um, the actual paper that uh, where I've uh, broken this down for all these lectures is also for found for free on our website. You can just click on the link in the description box and that'll take you to it. That way you can see what we're reading and what we're going through. The lectures on faith are, are set up in such a way that the lecture is given and uh, then at the end of the lecture, there's a series of questions. So Joseph asks some questions or um, uh, Signy, whoever you want to say, originally wrote it, but it was under the direction of Joseph, um, asked some questions, and then we have the answer, right? Then we have the answer provided. And um, the way we're going to be going through this or have been going through this is that we start first with the questions, then we go and read the lecture. So Joseph points us to the point of the lecture where the answer is found. Then we're going to read Joseph's answer, and then we'll talk about it. And like I've said in previous lectures on faith, this style of study is is what will change how quickly you learn the doctrine of the church exponentially. If you can learn how to ask questions go and then look for the answers in the appropriate locations and then attempt to answer them using the spirit and then rinse and repeat. Uh, your, your learning of the doctrine will grow exponentially versus just sitting down and just, I'm going to read a verse or two or whatever people decide, or I'm going to start at the beginning of the book and go to the end of the book. Um, you'll, you'll find in some of those cases that you'll be like, yay, I read the entire old Testament. And, uh, you'll be like, yeah, what'd you learn? Nothing. I learned absolutely nothing. Um, and so, if, whereas if you do this, you, you might only read a, a single story. For example, Joseph being sold into Egypt, uh, and you'll just keep going back to it and back to it and back to it and go, man, as, uh, as Blake said recently in Discord, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And so, it, it, it's not, if you study like this, uh, the, the growth rate is exponential. So, I, I if... If nothing else, if, if you are having a hard time wrapping your heads around uh, the lecture on faith, if nothing else, I, I exhort you, I plead with you to please learn this style of learning and try to replicate it in your own life. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read the question. I'm going to read the lecture uh, where Joseph says the answer is. I'm then going to read Joseph's answer, and then we're going to talk about it, um, adding a little bit of uh, our own um, flavor, you could say, uh, uh, to it afterwards but then uh before we continue if anybody in the chat has any questions on what we just read or any comments or maybe they had something that the spirit uh said hey you know what a good a good example of what they're talking about right now is blank uh please share it in the chat and if you get put like a little at or uh, at the two LDS archives or um at uh, defending zion uh one of us will hopefully see it and that way we can uh, uh, we can read it before continuing on and so um, hopefully, hopefully that made sense. So that's, that's the, the pattern that we're going to be going over um, today. And I will quickly here. So another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be changing the actual picture that everyone is looking at. So there we go. So this is the, the, the first question or series of questions that we're going to be going over today. Uh, questions 14 and six, 14 through 16. And uh, once again, we're going over the second half of lecture three. And the questions read, what effect would it have on any rational being not to have an idea that the Lord was God, the creator and upholder of all things? Why would it prevent him from exercising faith in God? Does this idea prevent this doubt and then he sends us back to lecture the lecture on faith so let's read it lecture an uh, acquaintance with these attributes in the divine character is essentially necessary in order that the faith of any rational being can center in him for life and salvation and once again if you remember uh lecture on faith number three that comes up time and time again right we're not just talking about having faith we're having talk we're talking about having faith sufficient for life and salvation. That's something a little bit more. For if he did not, in the first instance, believe him to be God, that is, the creator and upholder of all things, he could not center his faith in him for life and salvation, for fear there should be a greater than he, who would thwart all of his, 
all his plans, and he, like the gods of the heathen, would be unable to fulfill his promises. But, seeing he is God overall, from everlasting to everlasting, the creator and upholder of all things, no such fear can exist in the minds of those who put their trust in him, so that in this respect their faith can be without wavering. Okay, so that was the lecture. So let's read Joseph's answer to this question. The answer is to the question that hopefully we're seeing on our screen right now. Better check that. No one's seeing that? Okay, good. It's there. Quote, it would prevent him from exercising faith in him unto life and salvation because he would be as the heathen, not knowing, but there might be a greater uh, there be a being greater and more powerful than he, and thereby he be prevented from fulfilling his promises. But does, for persons having this idea, are enabled thereby to exercise faith without this doubt, end quote. And then we will now... Uh, so, okay. I like... <laughs> so I like when these questions are asked, um, particularly where Joseph is pointing out that the, the key doctrine we have to understand or the idea we have to understand is that God is the, is the creator and upholder of the universe. I like to go into the scriptures and I like to actually find scriptures that prove that truth or that, that are a second witness of that truth. So as I did that, I found quite a few um, stories in the scriptures where this particular truth was either um, demonstrated in the person's experience or it was taught by somebody else. Uh, so the first one I'll mention is Moses. In Moses chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Behold, thou art my son, wherefore look. And I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands, but not all, for my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. So once the Lord tells Moses this, he then proceeds to deliver to Moses a grand vision of his creation of all things. Second one is Abraham. In Abraham chapter 3, uh, Abraham says, I, Abraham, have the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God had given unto me in Ur of the Chaldees. And I saw the stars, that they were very great, and that one of them was nearest unto the throne of God. And there were many great ones which were near unto it. And the Lord said unto me, These are the governing ones. And the name of the great one is Kolob, because it is, because it is near unto me. For I am the Lord thy God. I have set this one to govern all those which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. So again, Abraham here is told the Lord is the creator of, of these great ones that govern all else that Abraham's seen. And, and then he proceeds to have a similar uh, vision of the creation of all things. Uh, the third one, and I think probably the clearest example of God demonstrating that he is the creator and upholder of the universe um, is Enoch and his vision. And that's in Moses chapter seven. He says, I saw the Lord and he stood before my face and he talked with me, even as a man talketh one with another face to face. And he said unto me, look, and I will show unto thee the world for the space of many generations. And after that Zion was taken up into he heaven, Enoch beheld, and lo, all the nations of the earth were before him. And there came generation upon generation, and Enoch was high and lifted up, even in the bosom of the Father and of the Son of Man. And behold, the power of Satan was upon all the face of the earth. And he saw angels descending out of heaven, and he heard a voice, a loud voice, saying, Woe, woe be unto the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld Satan, and he had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, fell on many, 
and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. And Enoch bore record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? And were it possible that man could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations. So Enoch gained a knowledge of the reality of God as the creator and upholder of the universe. His knowledge came not only from being able to see as God sees, but from knowing that God was the one that had granted him this ability, this ability to be able to witness all of these creations through all of space and all of time. Now, going to the Book of Mormon, in Nephi's experience, starting in 1 Nephi 11, the Spirit also declared this truth to Nephi. And this is what the Spirit said. The Spirit cried with a loud voice, saying, Hosanna to the Lord, the Most High God, for he is God over all the earth, yea, even above all. And then later in the Book of Mormon, when Christ personally comes and ministers to the Nephites, one of the very first things that he teaches is his identity as the God of the whole earth. In 3 Nephi 11, 14, the Savior says, Arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. Now, this doctrine, this truth, this idea is so important that even the greatest missionaries in the Book of Mormon recognized and taught this fundamental truth. Um, when you look at the experience that Aaron has with the father of King Lamoni in Alma 22, um, believest thou that there is a God? And the king said, I know that the Amalekites say that there is a God, and I have granted unto them that they should build sanctuaries, that they may assemble themselves together to worship him. And if now thou sayest there is a God, behold, I will believe. And now when Aaron heard this, his heart began to rejoice. And he said, Behold, assuredly as thou livest, O king, there is a God. And the king said, Is God that great spirit that brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem? And Aaron said unto him, Yea, he is that great spirit. And he created all things, both in heaven and in earth. Believest thou this? And he said, Yea, I believe that the great spirit created all things. And I desire that ye should tell me concerning all these things. And I will believe thy words. All right. So let's um, sum this up real quick in layman's terms so what effect would it have on a rational being's mind uh to have an idea that god is the creator and upholder of things or not okay in layman terms you have to believe what we're being taught here is that we have to have an understanding that god is over all and the reason for that is because if he was not in control if there was not a level of control we would have no ability to have faith that that he would be able to make good on his promises right if there's a bigger fish in the sea there's always the chance that god could get eaten by it i mean that that is that is what we're, we're what would happen in your mind and it would keep you from being able to exercise faith in him okay and so knowing that god uh, is a creator and controls this sphere, this sphere in perfection, it does prevent doubt in the individual of, of these, of these things that creep up in our life. It will, it will provide that anchor for you. Um, and so I thought here is also, um, um, 
an, a real life application of this that I've seen. So I, I, I like to do this. So when we're going through these lectures on faith, people might say, oh, well, um, I knew that. Or I, I yeah, that, that makes sense. But then, okay, so here's a real life application of of something that I've seen, and I've seen it a couple times, um, that you that if you had an understanding of what's taught in the lectures on faith, you would know that what the individual is sharing with you is not true. So um, I was listening to a YouTuber, okay, an LDS YouTuber, and he shared the story, uh, shared a story of one of the uh, most powerful experiences in his life, according to him. And he, he, what he was struggling with is he, he was having a question that he didn't know the answer to. He didn't know the answer to. And he tracked it into this lady, and this lady said, look, I need to share something with you. And they said, okay. And then she proceeded to tell the story about how she uh, died in a car crash with, her, with, her, uh, with, with the passenger that was in the car with her. And she w woke up. And there was an angel or Jesus there. I believe it was Jesus. And the angel said unto her, or Jesus said unto her, Oh, there's been a mistake. You're not supposed to die. Go back. And this individual then woke up next to the car. The passenger was dead. And, um, and uh, this individual continued with their life. This Latter-day Saint was sharing the story as a way to 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 that his understanding that God was not in control of everything, that that God that God did not um, that God could in theory make mistakes. Oops, I'm sorry, you weren't supposed to die today. Um, if somebody had an accurate understanding of the lectures on faith, they would understand that if you held that belief, if you held the belief that that, oh, whoops, uh, you know, God's up there making mistakes all the time. He can't control this sphere that we would constantly be riddled with doubt. We would constantly be riddled with doubt. And and we would never be able to exercise faith sufficient for life and salvation. So there's a, a, a an application that I can point to immediately and say, if somebody understood the lectures on faith... This is something that would help clear something out and enable people to exercise more perfect faith in our uh, in our Creator and and our God. Uh, Defending Zion here says the endowment also begins with revealing this ideal idea to us, and that's exactly right. Um, so uh, we understand that the endowment is to be endowed with power and or glory, and uh, I'm sure Blake. So Blake, what's what 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 what's synonymous with glory? Light and truth. There it is. Light and truth. And so we're in there to gain light and truth and glory. And the very first things that we're taught about are exactly what uh, uh, what this is. This is uh, this lecture. These questions is talking about. So um, there is huge power in that. So. Um, Anyway, so any questions before we go on to the next one? I don't see it. If you do have questions and I, for whatever reason or other, Blake's a lot better at seeing comments than I am. Um... But if we don't get to it, or if I somehow miss it and Blake somehow miss it, uh, we're not trying to ignore you. So. Yep, I'll keep an eye on it. All right, so here's the second question. We have it up on the screen, or second series of questions. And uh, these questions go as follows. Quote, is it not also necessary to have the idea that God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and full of goodness. And why is that knowledge necessary? So let's go back and let's read the lecture. The lecture states, But secondly, unless he, God, was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness, such is the weakness of human nature, and so great 
the frailties and imperfections of men, then unless they believe that these excellencies existed in the divine character, the faith necessary to salvation could not exist. For doubt would take the place of faith, and those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation. If it were not for the idea which they have of the excellency of the character of God that he is slow to anger, long-suffering, and of a forgiving disposition, and doth forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, an idea of these facts does away doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. The answer to the question that, that uh, Joseph provides is, it is. Because of the weakness and imperfections of human nature and the great frailties of man, for such is the weakness of man and such his frailties, that he is liable to sin continually. And if God were not long-suffering and full of compassion, gracious and merciful, and of a forgiving disposition, man would be cut off from before him, in consequence of which he would be in continual doubt and could not exercise faith for where doubt is their faith has no power but by man's believing that god is full of compassion and forgiveness long suffering and slow to anger he can exercise faith in him and overcome doubt so as to be exceedingly strong end quote This is, like you mentioned with the last question, this is an area where I think without a correct understanding of and putting God's long suffering, his mercy and his graciousness in the proper light, I think we will tend to uh, to overemphasize or over uh, attribute god's mercy at the expense of his justice so the way i'm going to talk here isn't to discount god's justice and and his um the way that he is in dealing with the sinner and with those that that make mistakes so i'm merely going to be highlighting the book of mormon and what the book of mormon really teaches us in regards to this mercy this long suffering, but it isn't again to 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 downplay or to to minimize that aspect of God's character. So, like I said, the Book of Mormon really is a unique book in that it demonstrates both the intimate nature and the all encompassing extent of God's mercy and long suffering. Uh, the picture that we get from the Book of Mormon really is of a man that's far more concerned or intent on providing ways for mercy to be exercised as opposed to just punishing or as opposed to just getting retribution um, against men for their sinful acts. Again, this isn't to say that justice does not have a place. Far from it. Um, but as I've read the Book of Mormon, as I look at this doctrine, I tend to see Instead of swift judgment, I see the Lord making a painstaking effort, indeed every effort, to reclaim the sinner. Now, the Book of Mormon is also unique in another way, because it teaches about God's mercy and God's grace, and says it's a part of God's character, but it does it through the experiences and the stories and the actions of ordinary followers of Jesus Christ. So we see in the Book of Mormon ordinary people like Nephi that frankly forgives his brothers and then continues to teach and exhort them despite the fact that they beat him with a rod, they tied him up multiple times, and they left him to die. Now when you consider these facts, it's no wonder that Nephi would choose to include this revelation about Jesus Christ. In 1 Nephi 19.9, And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore, they scourge him, and he suffereth it. 
and they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. We also see it in ordinary people like Zenith, who chooses to see the good in their enemy. I, Zenith, having been taught in all the language of Nephites, and having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, or the land of our father's first inheritance, and having been sent as a spy among the Lamanites, that I might spy out their forces, that our army might come upon them and destroy them. But when I saw that which was good among them, I was desirous that they should not be destroyed. There's also ordinary people like Ammon and the sons of Mosiah who sinned and then felt the joy of forgiveness. And it led them to proclaim, who could have supposed that our God would have been so merciful as to have snatched us from our awful, sinful, and polluted state? Behold, we went forth even in wrath with mighty threatenings to destroy his church. Mm -hmm. Oh, then, why did he not consign us to an awful destruction? Yea, why did he not let the sword of his justice fall upon us and doom us to eternal despair? Oh, my soul, almost as it were, fleeth at the thought. Behold, he did not exercise his justice upon us, but in his great mercy hath brought us over that everlasting, everlasting gulf of death and misery, even to the salvation of our souls. And just as with them, also was it with Alma, who saw that God was willing to send an angel and to cause the earth to tremble just to get him to wake up. For I went about with the sons of Mosiah, seeking to destroy the church of God. But behold, God sent his holy angel to stop us by the way. There's also ordinary people like the anti-Nephi Lehi's that would rather die than to take the life of their enemy. And now, my brethren, if our brethren seek to destroy us, behold, we will hide away our swords. Yea, even we will bury them deep in the earth, that they may be kept bright, as a testimony that we have never used them at the last day. And if our brethren destroy us, behold, we shall go to our God and shall be saved. And now it came to pass when the king had made an end of these sayings, and all the people were assembled together, they took their swords and all the weapons which were used for the shedding of man's blood, and they did bury them up deep in the earth. And this they did, it being in their view a testimony to God and also to men, that they never would use weapons against again for the shedding of man's blood. And this they did, vouching and covenanting with God, that rather than shed the blood of their brethren, they would give up their own lives. And the last example is my favorite prophet in the Book of Mormon, Mormon. Um, he continued to stand as a witness of God's mercy to his people, even when his people appeared beyond repentance. He says, Behold, I had led them, notwithstanding their wickedness, I had led them many times to battle, and had loved them according to the love of God which was in me, with all my heart. And my soul had has been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. And it came to pass that I utterly refused to go up against mine enemies. And I did even as the Lord had commanded me. And I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard according to the manifestations of the Spirit which had testified of things to come. Well, I knew I liked you, Blake, because Mormon's my favorite guy in the Book of Mormon, too. So that's uh, that's good. I, I think Mormon is um, is one of the <laughs> – I think it's amazing that, yes. that Mormon abridged, abridged and did all that work. But I, 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 I feel like he's one of the most underappreciated um, um, examples of being a, a righteous individual in the entire Book of Mormon. I mean there's so many – uh, Nephi's and Abin, uh, Abinadi and, and there's so many other people who uh, even Moroni 
who get uh, a lot of uh, love and attention. And I feel like it's crazy that the, that the book was even named after him. And uh, we don't talk about him a lot. Um, and man, uh, the the guy the guy was a uh, the guy did it all. Um, uh, was a historian. Uh, yes. Was a warrior. Was um, a, a man of God. So yeah, I and apparently was a good father because Moroni Moroni was a, a stud. So um, before I jump into what I was going to say here, since I've already kind of broken up, there's a question here. Uh, from Charles that says that he always understood grace and mercy to be synonyms. Are they truly different when it comes to the gospel? Um, there's actually a scripture that I was actually going to use uh, right now that was tying into what Blake was uh, talking about between justice and, and, and mercy. And uh, it's that very common or very um, popular, very famous scripture in the Book of Mormon where uh, it says that we're saved by grace after all we can do. And grace, uh, grace is a, a, a is a concept. It's a saving concept of making up the difference. Um, mercy is applied to, uh, uh, as uh, Blake gave many examples here. Mercy is applied even without people's best efforts. Um, um, Nephi referred to them as tender mercies. Um, th they are things that uh, people utterly <laughs> don't qualify for. Um, like, uh, th these examples that, that Blake just read where the Lord should have, should have, should have wiped us out of the land. We shouldn't even be here, but due to the Lord's mercy, uh, we're still here. And so, um, that's how I would personally, it, when asked how to, to differentiate the two, um, that, that is how I would, uh, Blake, would you, uh, would you add anything to that to help people who might, uh, not understand the, the the contextual differences between how grace is applied and how mercy is applied. Well, I don't, I don't know that elder Bednar would have used those same words, but the concepts, the way, and the way you're describing it is exactly what he says. Um, he talks about the enabling power of the atonement, right? So that's, that's the mercy that is, is just there uh, with God, but there's also the, the the salvation aspect of it the the saving the sinner from their sin and like you mentioned that is grace right that's that's that providing it um once once we repent of our sins and well not once we repent of our sins but um because we repent of our sins and um and do that so i think his his paradigm where he explains that matches perfectly with what he said and right. good question, Charles. Yes, very good question. Um, uh, 2 Nephi 28, I also want to read this scripture. Um, and I think that it, it ties into a little bit what we're discussing once again in Discord, and those who are familiar with this paper of mine, um, but it also ties into the mercy of God. So I'm going to read these both. Uh, 2 Nephi 28, verses 31 and 32. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm, or shall hearken unto the precepts of men, save their precepts shall be given by the power of the Holy Ghost. Woe be unto the Gentiles, saith the Lord God of hosts, for notwithstanding I shall lengthen out my arm unto them from day to day. Okay, now what is this? This is mercy. I shall lengthen out my arm unto them from day to day. They will deny me. Okay, and if you deny the Lord, are we given grace? Okay, the answer to that is no. So we're, we're shown mercy, uh, but grace is not obtained. Nevertheless, I will be merciful unto them. Okay, so he's going to continue to be merciful to them. Sayeth the Lord God, if they will repent and come unto me. For mine arm is lengthened out all the day long, saith the Lord God of hosts. And I, and I wanted to, to tie that in here because I, I think that um, there, there's a key indicator in here that, that, once again, if you understood the lectures on faith and you understood the, the doctrine, some of these things would not be so um, confusing to us. And here here is one of those, okay, where we're talking about in this question, we're asking, um, is it not necessary to have an idea that God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and full of goodness? Why is that necessary? Why is that necessary? And we explain why it's necessary. 
We explain why it's, or, or Joseph does, why it's necessary to have that. Because if we didn't know that, we wouldn't go to the Lord. And that's the important thing. And a lot of times where we talk about this justice and mercy and grace, this is where these, these connect, right? The Lord's arms are extended all the day long. So what is he teaching there? He is teaching, I am perfectly long-suffering. I am perfectly compassionate. I am perfectly forgiving. But you have to come unto me. If you come unto me and repent, I will take care of the rest. I will apply the grace and make up the difference. But if you don't come unto me, if you don't exercise faith in me, if you don't repent then justice has its demands on you. And so what people will do is they'll conflate the two. They'll say, because God is long-suffering and merciful, that means I don't have to do anything. And that's not the case. Knowing that God is long-suffering and compassionate gives us the, gives us the ability to go before God, go before Christ, knowing he's saying, look, I'm standing here with my arms extended all day long. Now, if you understand that, that then you would be much more inclined to, to, to go down and kneel before him and say, look, I'm a sinner. I've done these horrible things. Please forgive me. Please apply your grace. Help me get out of here. Help me repent and help me become a better person. That, that's, and once again, faith is power, right? We learned this in the other... The other lecture on faith it is enabling it's what moves us forward right and so um to have a correct idea that god is merciful will add to that power to have us continually go back to him and um, i also go over this in my paper um um sins of rebellion versus sins of weakness on youtube i uh labeled it um the truth about pornography uh, same concepts, same concepts. So any other questions before we go on to the next one? I absolutely, I absolutely love these lectures on faith. How we get better, how we exercise faith. All right, so here's the next question here. It should be coming up. There it is, question number three. The question is, is it not equally as necessary that man should have an idea that God changes not? Oh my goodness, is this an important one. Neither is there variableness with him. In order to exercise faith into him, faith in him, unto life and salvation so once again here we go back to this life and salvation thing again the question is is it not necessary that man should have this idea that god changes not there is no variableness in him in order in order for all of us to exercise faith in the lord unto life and salvation is that a requirement do we have to know this do we have to believe that God doesn't change and that he's bound by laws? Do we have to believe that in order to exercise faith unto life and salvation? Well, here's what the lecture says. But it is equally as necessary that men should have the idea that he is a God who changes not in order to have faith in him as it is to have the idea that he is gracious and long-suffering. For without the idea of his unchangeableness in the character of the deity, doubt would take the place of faith. But with the idea that he changes not, faith lays hold upon the excellencies in his character with unshaken confidence, believing he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round. So Joseph's answer... It is because without this, he would not know how soon the mercy of God might change into cruelty, his long suffering into rashness, 
his love into hatred, and in consequence of which, doubt, man would be incapable of exercising faith in him, but having the idea that he is unchangeable, man can have faith in him continually, believing that what he was yesterday, he is today and will be forever, end quote. Uh, this, when I was going through this and studying this, this was a, this was probably the most challenging of all the, the attributes to, to really understand and comprehend like what Joseph is saying with, with unchangeableness. And so I, I stuck again to the Book of Mormon here to, to really understand this. The first thing we have to remember about this is unchangeableness Joseph says, is a character trait of the deity. Okay, so this is part of God's character. So there's, as I examined it, there was two ways that I saw God, God's character is unchangeable. First, um, the path that God walks, or in other words, the life that he lives, is unchangeable. And this is taught in Alma 7.20. I perceive that it has been made known unto you by the testimony of his word that he cannot walk in crooked paths, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said, neither hath he a shadow of turning from the right to the left, or from that which is right to that which is wrong. Therefore his course is one eternal round. The second way in which God is unchangeable is the manner in which God chooses to reveal himself or express himself to his children. And that's not based upon the specific time period that a person lives, and it's not based on any other distinguishing characteristics. And we see this uh, truth in a couple places in the Book of Mormon. In Alma 39, behold, you marvel why these things should be uh, known so long beforehand. Behold, I say unto you, is not a soul at this time as precious unto God as a soul will be at the time of his coming? Is it not as necessary that the plan of redemption should be made known unto this people as well as unto their children? Is it not as easy at this time for the Lord to send his angel to declare these glad tidings unto us as unto our children or as after the time of his coming? And in Alma 24, and the great God has had mercy on us and made these things known unto us that we might not perish. Yea, and he has made these things known unto us beforehand because he loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children. Therefore, in his mercy, he doth visit us by his angels that the plan of salvation might be made known unto us as well as unto future generations. So again, no difference between when the time period is that God's interacting with us. He reveals that same character um, then, now, and in the future, he will reveal that same character. So uh, Charles here shares a scripture here, and now if you have imagined up unto yourselves a God who doth vary, in whom there is shadow of changing... Then have ye imagined up under, unto yourselves a God who is not a God of miracles? Is that uh, is that Moroni chapter seven? He didn't put a he didn't put a reference there. Um, I, yeah, I think so. Uh, but that is an Moroni e seven or eight or twelve. But yeah, Mormon. <laughs> Oh, we're wrong. There we go. Going back to Mormon. <laughs> yeah. Mormon 10. That's good. Yeah, that's good. This is actually, yeah. Yeah, this is great. I think this is Moroni speaking in here. But yeah, that, oh yeah. Now have you imagined up unto yourselves a God who doth vary, in whom there's a shadow changing, then you have imagined up unto yourselves a God who is not a god of miracles.
but I will show unto you a God of miracles, even the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it is the same God who created oh, the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. Wow, oh, it's, it's almost like Moroni's teaching the lectures on faith here. <laughs> Isn't uh, thank you for sharing that one, uh, uh, Charles. That one, that is, those two encap encapsulate encapsulate uh, th this uh, part of the lecture on faith perfectly. Both, both everything we've gone over today. So yeah, that that is awesome. And then later on, the same Moroni gives us Ether uh, chapter twelve and uh, Moroni chapter seven, um, where he just I expounds on this further because it, it is so important. Um, so important and if you go back a little bit further in there he he says here you need to read the scriptures uh if you've denied these things uh it's because you don't know the gospel of jesus christ yea he hath not read the scriptures if so he does not understand them you know what's funny i i think that president nelson said something very similar to that last conference didn't he blake yeah I think he. I think he said. Yes, he did. I think he said, if you can't, you can't exercise a, a, a particle of faith. It might be because you're a lazy learner and a lax disciple. So I, I think maybe that he's quoting Moroni here. For do we not read that God is the same yesterday, to today, and forever, and in Him there is no variableness, neither a shadow of changing? Wow, these are awesome. Uh, Thank you for sharing those, Charles. This is exactly what we're talking about here. Um, this is something that that we have to we have to understand. We have to understand. And Blake uh, gave uh, two things here. He's talking about the character, and then he talked about the the mode of revealing himself. Now, bo both of those are really important to to grasp. But uh, because th what what we're getting at here is that none of these aspects change with God. None of them change. So if God uses the keys to reveal his will in a specific way, back with Adam, back with Moses, back with Joseph Smith, guess what? He's going to do the same thing today. It's going to be the same thing today. And it's not going to change. So, you know, there there's, isn't going to be a mode transportation in the which... God reveals himself unto man. That's not going to change. It's not going to change. The other aspect is, is that he, uh, Blake mentioned, it's the characteristics. That also, it just won't change. He's not going to get angry one day and happy the next day. He's not a schizophrenic. He's not bipolar. Uh, he, he's not, because, and if he had these characteristics, it would be impossible for you to trust him. It'd be absolutely impossible to trust him. You wouldn't know which God you're dealing with on any given day. And the last thing that uh, I would also say is that uh, his course, so we have his characteristics, the way he reveals himself, I would say there's a third way, and that is that he doesn't change, and that's his alt, his path that he takes. So we're talking about the course, the course that he walks, as Blake said, he kind of put that in the first one. It doesn't change. So when the scripture uh, says, I, the Lord, uh, uh, take not that to do in my heart, but that which I will do. Um, I, I say nothing, but that what I will do. And the concept is, is that, that God won't say something and then not do it right. There, there is a, there is a, a, a unchangeableness on this. And once again, so once again, giving real life applications to this real life applications to this, if people understood this doctrine, if people understood it, then they would not make such claims such as that God can do whatever he wants whenever he wants to. That is a claim that you will hear. Uh, that I, I, see, I think I hear that more on from LDS YouTubers than any other claim that, that, I, that blows me away because it, is, it flies directly in the face of, of what we learn in lecture on faith here. God, God can just do whatever he wants to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. God said that, you know, he's gonna, uh, that Jackson County, Missouri, it's going to be the place for the new Jerusalem. Yeah, I get that. He said that. And God did say that it's not going to change and that there's not going to be another place appointed, but God can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to. 
Now, I have literally heard that. Literally heard that. And um, what we learn here in the lecture on faith here, conclusively, is that if somebody has that belief, if you believe that God can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to, that he, that he is changeable, he can, change his, he can change all the time. If you have that belief, you will never be able to exercise faith sufficient unto life and salvation. That is what the, the doctrine here teaches us. So we have to throw that away. We have to throw away these ideas that God can change, that God can, can say that he's going to, you know, send his son and then decide on Tuesday, nah, you know what, I'm not going to send Jesus. You know, that, that I don't, I, I'm, I've changed my mind. We have to throw that out. We have to throw those beliefs out because if we have those beliefs, if we, we indulge in those beliefs, we will not be able to have faith uh, sufficient for, to life and salvation. And so we have to throw those out. We have to throw those out. All right, so we're going to go to question number four. Once again, thank you for sharing that that set of scriptures. That was absolutely perfect. Uh, definitely ties on one, two, and three together. Definitely ties them together absolutely perfectly. All right, so four should be popping up on the screen here real quick. Um, the last uh, uh, three sets of, of these things are uh, pretty darn self-explanatory, so we're going to burn through those pretty quick, so... Uh, don't worry about that. don't worry about time. The last ones will go through really quick. Question four here says, is it not necessary also for man to have an idea that God is a being of truth before they can have perfect faith in him? The lecture teaches, quote, and again, the idea that he is a God of truth and cannot lie is equally as necessary to exercise faith in him as the idea of his unchangeableness. For without the idea that he was a God of truth and cannot lie, the confidence necessary to uh, be placed in his word in order to exercise faith in him could not exist. But having the idea that he is not man, that he can, uh, that he can lie, it gives power to the mind of men to exercise faith in him. Okay, so Joseph's answer, it is necessary to know this, for unless men have this idea... They cannot place confidence in the Lord's words and not being able to place confidence in his words. They could not have faith in him, but believing that he is a God of truth and that his word cannot fail, their faith can rest in him without doubt. End quote. Yeah, believing this truth in particular I think causes us to see and to feel things um, as they really are. So because God is a God of truth, um, truth is manifest by him and in him. And two examples that stood out to me of this, uh, first, first one is uh, Enos. This is what he says. And there came a voice unto me saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee. And thou shalt be blessed. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie. Wherefore, my guilt was swept away. So Enos's guilt was literally swept away because he knew that God was not lying when he told him, thy sins are forgiven thee. That gave him power to obtain that that remission or that that um, cleansing of that guilt that he felt. The second example is Mahanrai Moriankamer and the story of the brother of Jared. So this is this is kind of what I saw in that story that showed me how this truth or this idea is exercised. So this is uh, Ether chapter three, and the Lord said unto him unto Mahanrai Moriankamer, Believest thou the words which I shall speak? And he answered, Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, 
for thou art a God of truth and canst not lie. And when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him and said, because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore, ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore, I show myself unto you. So I want you to notice the way in which the Lord phrases the question to Mahanrai Moriankamer. He isn't asking Mahanrai if he believes the things which the Lord has already spoken. He's asking Mahanrai if he believes the things which the Lord has yet to speak, words which the Lord himself has not uttered. Think about that difference here. So on one hand, to believe in something which the Lord has already spoken doesn't necessarily require you to believe that God is a God of truth. You can hold that belief, and it can be founded upon other evidences. But in Mahanrai's case, he had evidence from the scriptures that the Lord could provide light in the barges. This was something that the Lord had already accomplished with Noah, as, as Micah pointed out in his presentation about um, faith as the brother of Jared. So that was, that was an evidence that was already available to Mahanrai upon which he could exercise faith in the Lord. But it's something completely different to believe in things or believe things that the Lord has not yet spoken. And I think that that belief can only be founded on a belief that God is a God of truth. There's no other powers by which a person can hold that belief. It only happens when they believe that God is a God of truth and cannot lie. I, I hope that makes sense, you know, this, this past evidences versus future, uh, future understanding of, of God's character. Um, I think that that story portrays that perfectly. Yeah, this is absolutely a tie-in uh, to uh, having the faith as the brother of Jared. We just, you just won't be able to have it. Um, you just won't be able to have it. You have to understand that God cannot lie. You have to understand that he doesn't change. You have to have, you have to know all these things, right? Like we, we went over this in the other lecture. There's, um, you have to, under, the, the, the three things that we have to know to, in order to exercise faith in, in God, right? And this is off the top of my head. There was that it, the path that he's walking is in accordance with his will, his characteristics, uh, and attributes. And, uh, what was the third one? Wow. Try to chew it off the top of my head. And now I, I crashed. What were the three, the three things that were necessary? The course of life that they're pursuing. The course of life that they're pursuing is in accordance with God's will. Okay, so there's that. Then there's right. yeah, that's one of them. Then there is that his characteristics and attributes. And then the third was what? Oh, that the course of life that they're pursuing is in accordance with His will, isn't it? Is okay. So we, I have that one. What's what? The number two is. So we start with that one. The next one is that. Um, his characteristics and his attributes. What's the third one? Wow. Uh, I don't I just, know. I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a or blank. Or are we conflating two into one? <laughs> I, might, I might be combining two into one there. Now I'm going to have to go back and check it out. But we, all of those are necessary to exercise faith. And and uh, Mohanrai, the brother of Jared, had them all. Had them all. And so that that's what we need to to understand. And once again, this one ties in very closely to what I was talking about or what we went over in the other one. God doesn't change, right? Because uh, lying is another one that that in some cases, some people might even almost view that as a lie, right? So if I say I'm going to I will 100 percent send my son, Jesus Christ. And then goes, you know what? Um, now I'm going to send John instead of my son you know some might view that as changing some might view that as lying they're very closely related god can't do either he can't do either he's not gonna lie and he's not gonna he's not gonna change and we have to have that kind of faith 
in order to see the finger of the Lord, in order to see these miracles that we know are on our doorstep, that we know are involved in the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. We have to have um, that kind of faith. Yeah, so, okay, so the three are, first, the idea that he actually exists. Oh, he's Second, real. a correct idea of his character, perfections and attributes. And then third, what I was saying, a knowledge that the course of life they're pursuing is in accordance with his will. So That's it. So he just, ha okay, the first, the other one was, we just have to know he's there. Got it. Yes, the human testimony. Yeah. We have to know he's there. All right, Reba. That one seems a little, that one seems a little self-explanatory, but it's just as important. We obviously... How do we know in whom there we have not been told? That's exactly right. Um, Lisa here says that yep. all that might be true, right? But uh, some cases God doesn't say when. Now that's absolutely accurate, right? We we don't necessarily know when some of these things are going to take place, but we should have a perfect faith that they will take place. So that that's exactly right. All right, so let's uh, thank you for that one. I was floundering there in the first one, and and it's the one that I like the most. It's the human testimony. It's the missionary work. Ah, the mi missionaries are gonna butcher me. So, I I am so sorry, missionaries. I'm so sorry. I uh, I have let the missionaries down. Okay, I got I got it now though, for another five minutes. Okay, so question number five. Could man exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life? Un could man exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life unless he believed that God was no respecter of persons? Okay, so there's the question. Hopefully it's showing up on our screen so everyone can read it as we're going over this. I see it there, so good. So hopefully everyone can read that. Uh, lecture says, quote, but it is also necessary that man should have an idea that he is no respecter of persons. This is another one of uh, the character traits. For with the idea of all the other excellencies in his character and this one wanting, men could not exercise faith in him because if he were a respecter of persons, they could not tell what their privileges were. Were nor how far they were authorized to exercise faith in him or whether they were authorized to do it at all. But all must be confusion. But no sooner are the minds of men made acquainted with the truth on this point, that he is no respecter of persons, than they see that they have authority by faith to lay hold on eternal life, the richest boon of heaven, because God is no respecter of persons, and that every man and every nation has equal privilege. Man, I'll tell you what, uh, this is uh, one that uh, we need to understand as a church, because uh, I can tell you a perfect example of something that comes up over and over and over again, uh, that, uh, that if we understood this, it wouldn't come up ever again. So Joseph's answer is, he could not. Because without this idea, he could not certainly know that it was his privilege so to do. And in consequence of this doubt, his faith could not be sufficiently strong to save him, end quote. Um, the thing that stood out to me in, in answering this question was actually what was said in the lecture itself, that, that last part about that every man in every nation has an equal privilege. So I tried to frame this into latter day speak or you know modern day speak, like what is this issue and where are we seeing it? And Micah, you'll probably have a little, uh, a different spin on it or take whatever. Um, the way I looked at it was in this, this conflation that's going on right now in our world between the ideas or the principles of equality and equity. So equality of opportunity and the freedom of choice being available to everyone, that's God's standard. Equity of outcome is Satan's counterfeit. And this idea actually leads people to believe that freedom of choice is not universally available. They believe that a person has freedom to choose or lacks it based on the circumstances of their genius, 
their strength, their skin color, whatever. And this belief in reality actually promotes division and promotes the respect of persons or differentiating between persons. So I thought it'd be helpful to go through and talk about what's God's standard and where do we see it in scriptures and then what's Satan's counterfeit. So God's standard is equality of opportunity and no respect of persons. In 2 Nephi 26, hath he commanded any that they should not partake of his salvation? Behold, I say unto you, nay, but he hath given it free for all men, and he hath commanded his people that they should persuade all men to repentance. Behold, hath the Lord commanded any that they should not partake of his goodness? Behold, I say unto you, nay, but all men are privileged, the one like unto the other, and none are forbidden. And he inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. And he de denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. And then the principle that's that's really undergirding God's standard, 2 Nephi 2.27, wherefore men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Now Satan's counterfeit is equity of outcome. Alma chapter 1, And it came to pass that in the first year of the reign of Alma in the judgment seat, there was a man brought before him to be judged, a man who was large and was noted for his much strength. I find it curious that you know, that his much strength is mentioned here, and we'll see why. And he had gone about among the people, preaching to them that which he termed to be the word of God, bearing down against the church, declaring unto the people that every priest and teacher ought to become popular, and they ought not to labor with their hands, but that they ought to be supported by the people. And he, meaning Nehor, also testified unto the people that all mankind should be saved at the last day, and that they need not fear nor tremble, but that they might lift up their heads and rejoice, for the Lord had created all men and had also redeemed all men. And in the end, all men should have eternal life. And it came to pass that he did teach these things so much that many did believe on his words even so many that they began to support him and give him money. And he began to be lifted up in the pride of his heart and to wear very costly apparel, yea, and even began to establish a church after the manner of his preaching. So Nehor is a perfect example of Satan's counterfeit. Um, he preached the idea of equity of outcome, that all were redeemed and that all would have eternal life. But what was the actual effect of this teaching in his life and this belief, holding this belief? Well, it caused him to believe that he um, could accept money for these teachings, priestcraft. And it caused him to wear very costly apparel, um, to, to stand out, um, to, to view himself as better in the eyes of the world. And then, you know, as a way to support this lifestyle, he then began to establish a church, his own church. Um, we also see this teaching in Korahor. Um, there's one particular verse that stands out here in verse 17. And many more such things did he say unto them, telling them that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men. But every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. So this again, this equity of outcome here, because there's no atonement or no God, we don't really, like there's no crime. I mean, we're all, you know, we're all equal. Whatever somebody chooses to do in their own life, that's that's okay. And if you choose to do something different, that's okay too, right? Um, there's, no, there's no crime. And 
and yet you're going to fare better in life and 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 there's going to be differences in people because some people are just smarter some people are just stronger so i want you to notice how korhor's acceptance of this counterfeit belief system really tainted his perception of the church of god and why he thought that people actually believed the church and why they belonged to it this is what he said and korhor said unto him because I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers, and because I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances, which are laid down by ancient priests, to usurp power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance, that they may not lift up their heads, but be brought down according to thy words. So because he had this tainted view of how the world worked, it, it – it, it um, caused him to project that onto the Church of God, where instead of seeing these priests giving these ordinances freely and using the, the power and authority they received from God to bless others, he saw it as a way for them to basically control the masses, uh, which is a dangerous thought, and it's a, it's a, it's a Marxist thought, right, that, that uh, religion— is the opioid of the masses, right? And so I think that this is a real issue that we're seeing in our day, where people are accepting this counterfeit. They're accepting that God is going to provide equity of outcome. And and then they see this, you know, they see this this um, inequality in society based upon people's choices or based upon the choices of of past generations and they think something has to be done with this or they go directly to the source and they say no that god is to blame uh, the government is to blame uh, structures in society are to blame so that's that's kind of how i i, I looked at this issue well that's exactly right and why it would it why it would keep you from being able to exercise faith if you had these kind of beliefs and yeah you would look at the church you would look at the church and say hey, you know what you're just teaching this to keep other people down you're just you you're, you're just trying to 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 bridle us and keep us down right it is uh to, yeah there's an absolute connection um um between uh these things absolute connection Absolute. Okay, so to bring this into layman terms, to wrap this up, um, the 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 being a respecter of persons. Why do we have to know that God is not a respecter of persons uh, before we can exercise faith uh, sufficiently uh, unto life and salvation? Um, if you have, if okay, I have some children. If I decided. Um, that, uh, so my little girl decides to spit in her brother's eye and, and, uh, you know, TP my house and, uh, paint all over the wall and she decides to do all that. And then I give her a popsicle and my son, um, he, um, stubbed his toe and then said, a, said a bad word. And I said, well, yeah, now you're not going to get a popsicle. If that is how I treated my kids, what would an intelligent, rational child take from that? What would they? What would their their assumption be? What would they, not even assumption? What would their the what would they glean from that? What would they learn from that? Well, I'll tell you that my daughter would learn that she can do she can do whatever she wants. And she'll still get love and she'll still get the rewards and she'll still get everything from Papa. And my son will learn, man, I have to, I, th there is nothing I can do to please this guy. You know, he just likes my sister more than me. He just likes her more. And because of that, what ends up happening? The daughter... She doesn't make any effort to, to live the commandments or to do what's right. And the son, if he has that belief, he has no desire to, to keep the commandments or, or get better. He's in a state of, of helplessness, 
And the daughter's in a state of just entitlement. So you have this situation where people are respecters of pe uh, persons, right? Where one person falls into a state of helplessness and the other person falls into a se sense of entitlement. And this is a doctrine that once again, if members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints understood, we wouldn't be having the conversations that we would be having. It w the, the, the knowledge that we would get would be as plain as the sun is from the darkness at night. If if an individual, if an individual is is bad and wicked, and they somehow make it into exaltation, and somebody who clearly lived a better life doesn't, the only rational belief that we could have looking at that is that God just liked that person more. And how fair would that be? How 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 uh, how how much justice? How much any of that would be in there? There would be none of it. And if if we if that was a reality, there would be no way for our children to have faith in us. They wouldn't act right. One would be helpless. One would be in a state of entitlement. And it's thus with God. We have to understand that God doesn't love one of His children more than another. He's not going to treat this member a certain way and say, okay, well, because you had a tough life or because I like the color of your hair or the color of your skin or because I like X, Y, and Z about you, I'm only going to require this much out of you. But you over here, I don't like you as much. I don't like the color of your skin. I don't like your hair. I don't like your gender, something. And because of that, your standards, your requirements are going to be higher. That is not true. That is utterly not true. God is no respecter of persons. The requirements on me are the same as the requirements that are on my wife, the same that are on my children, the same that are on uh, all of us. They're the same requirements, and we're all going to be judged against them. And we have to. We have to know that before we can exercise faith in them. We have to, because, because if we don't know that, we're either going to feel helpless and just say, I'm not loved as much as that other kid. I'm not as loved as that other member. And so there's no point. I give up. Or you're going to say, well, I'm one of the chosen. You know, I'm married to I'm married to a, a prophet or I'm married to somebody that's really important. I'm married to, you know, somebody who's really high up in the church. And therefore, I'm entitled to make it regardless of my actions. And faith is that power that enables us to um, to move forward. So that is that really important, uh, brothers and sisters to get a grasp uh, of this one. Once again, it's another one of those ones that you might listen to and go, well, yeah, obviously God is no respecter of persons, but man, people teach stuff and questions come up over and over and over again, as though they believe God is a respecter of persons, right? No, nope, but he's not. He provides that equality of opportunity for everyone. And to answer Charles' uh, question really quickly, with Christ, it's the same way. Christ was given the exact same opportunity as the rest of us. He was perfect. We were not. And so um, he loved Christ just as much as the rest of us and gave Christ the exact same opportunity as the rest of us. And so... You, you, God is not a respecter of persons, okay? Uh, and we actually learned this more in a, a, a lecture on faith number five. Um, and lecture on faith number five is that um, uh, it goes over this question, and I believe it's lecture on faith number five, um, where it talks about Christ uh, uh, living a perfect life and by do so doing prove that it was in the, the capacity of all men to do likewise. And so we'll get into that in lecture on faith number five. But um, Jesus was given the exact same opportunities as the rest of us. The only difference or the big difference <laughs> was Christ was perfect, right? Christ was perfect and we were not. Um, but that does not mean that God loved him more than the rest of us. Okay. The standards... Uh, uh, the standard by which God judge doesn't change, yes. Okay. 
Okay, hopefully people are going to uh, having their questions answered there. Hey, We're gonna... Micah? Yep. So, so let's think about the logical like conclusion. Let's think through this with Charles's question. If Christ loved, is if God the Father loved Christ more than us, and Christ did the things that He did, then that would show that God um, could only love could only love us if we reached Christ's standard, right? It, it tends to give us that thought that because because of Christ and who he was, that's why God loved him. Instead of because Christ was his son, can you see, I guess, how those two different ideas there give us an, you know, an understanding of like where that idea leads us to. So it kind of gives us a, an idea that God then, going back to the idea of unchangeableness, that somehow the standards or the way in which God lives um, changes depending on uh, who he's dealing with, which that's not the case. Yeah, and it would. You're right. It would also mean that that God could never could never love me the same way he loved Christ, because just, there's yeah. no we we didn't make yeah we didn't make that standard. Um, we didn't make that standard, and so that's just that's just not the case. God. That, uh, God loves us all equally. He gave us all the exact same opportunity. And uh, he wants us all to seize that opportunity and come back. But he can't play favorites when people come back. He can't play favorites. So, all right. So we're going on to the next question. Unless there was something else, we're going on to question number six. And like I said, these last couple questions here... Uh, we'll be really, really quick because I, I, I thought so, and so did Blake, that some of these were pretty self-explanatory, and they almost it almost uh, the last couple seemed a little repetitive. Um, so question here. Would it be possible for a man to exercise faith in God so as to be saved unless he had an idea that God was love? Okay, so I, th th what we just were kind of talking about here. Lecture, what it says here, quote, and lastly, but... Not less important, to exercise of faith in God is the idea that he is love. For with all the other excellencies in his character, without this one to influence them, they could not have such powerful dominion over the minds of men. But when the idea is planted in the mind that he is love, who cannot see the just ground that men of every nation, kindred, tongue, have to exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life. Joseph's answer here is that he could not, because man could not love God unless he had an idea that God was love. And if he did not love God, he could not have faith in him. End quote. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, we read this. Behold, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We love him because he first loved us. John here is teaching us the idea that God is love, uh, really is contained and revealed to man in the life and the mission of Jesus Christ. Every prophet since Adam has had a knowledge of Christ in his mission. And they've had that revealed to them. And they've understood that connection between Christ and the love of God. And I think this truth and this pattern is illustrated perfectly in Nephi's vision of the tree of life. In 1 Nephi 11, this is what he says. And behold, this thing 
shall be given unto thee for a sign, that after thou hast beheld the tree which bore the fruit which thy father tasted, thou shalt also behold a man descending out of heaven, and him shall ye witness. And after ye have witnessed him, ye shall bear record that it is the Son of God. And it came to pass that the Spirit said unto me, Look. And I looked and beheld a tree, and it was like unto the tree which my father had seen. And the beauty thereof was far beyond, yea, exceeding of all beauty. And the whiteness thereof did exceed the whiteness of the driven snow. And it came to pass, after I had seen the tree, I said unto the Spirit, I behold, thou hast shown unto me the tree, which is precious above all. And he said unto me, Knowest thou the condescension of God? And I said unto him, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. And the angel said unto me, Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? And I answered him, saying, Yea, it is the love of God, which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore, it is the most desirable above all things. Now, once a person has this knowledge of Christ revealed to them, and they personally experience God's love in their life, they then understand how to demonstrate true love for God. Jesus taught, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Now, where does our love of God eventually lead us? Christ also said, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So our love of God leads us to the Father and to the Son. This abode that's mentioned by the Savior is the mansion which Christ has already prepared for us in the kingdom of our Father. And it's the never-ending blessing of being able to partake of and exercise the love of the Father and the Son. Um, in le Later on Lectures on Faith, uh, we're going to be getting into the connections between love and charity and the mind of god and so i won't be getting into that here but uh suffice to say that those who are familiar with my papers i have used the quotes from the lecture on faith as well as um from um uh, quotes from the teaching of the prophet joseph smith and, and others and uh, the ones that uh, blake just went over here uh to, to to make that that connection between these things um G god is love it, it, it isn't just it isn't just a gut check emotion of uh, like when we think of love sometimes we think of more chemical responses it's something in our heart it's a feel good thing um with god it is even more than that it, it it is a way of thinking greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend it is a it is a mindset a willingness to sacrifice all for somebody else the the grace for grace it it, it is something that encompasses an, an an entire lifestyle it is not uh, it is not simply just a, a chemical response when you meet somebody of the opposite sex uh, this is something so much more deeper than that and when we understand that that is god that this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. This is my mind. This is my love. This is my desire. This is it. When you understand that, then just like Blake was talking about, then you can go off and go, wow, there is somebody that sees potential in me. There's somebody greater than me that's willing to give me grace for grace. Th then you can then go and do the likewise. You can then go, you know what? I can see potential in this person. I can see this person the same way Father in Heaven uh, sees uh, sees them, and I can understand this. I go over this in the, the talk, Eyes to See, I believe, uh, when I did the breakdown of that, uh, the, to, the understanding how we can actually know that. If we can know how God views us, and then we know that God is not a respecter of persons, we then can know how God views everyone else. 
So by knowing how God views me, and then knowing he's not a respecter of persons, I can then know that God views my neighbor the exact same way. And if I can feel in my very bones how God feels about me, I can then look at my neighbor and go, oh, wow, God feels that same way about you. And then that is how we can spread that. That is how that um, that knowledge then becomes contagious and can actually grow, and it's just a, a wonderful thing. But like I said, uh, we'll get I will get into that more when, when that breakdown happens in late, later lectures on faith. But if you wanted a, a, that a more in depth breakdown with the quotes from the teacher of the Prophet Joseph Smith, I would recommend probably going and seeing uh, my talk breakdown of um, of eyes to see. Um, that w where it was given not in the last conference but the conference before. Um, Fire and Ice said that we're only talking to Charles. Did we miss some comments that were directed at us, Blake? Uh, there was just one question. It didn't pertain to anything we're talking about, though, but it, it could be a question. Oh, I, I think we've answered it before about blacks and the priesthood and why it took so long. But... Oh, okay. Wow, okay. We tried. Uh, yeah, sorry, I missed that one, but I probably would have answered that at the end if I would have answered that one. That one's kind of a, a hard one just to give a quick 30-second answer to. Um, yeah. So we'll go on to the next one here. Was there any other ones other than that? That was it? If somebody, yeah, if people are doing questions, please just let us know. Um, like I said, these last two questions here are going to go relatively quick. They're uh, pretty... Um, pretty self-explanatory so they'll be uh, they'll be quick so we didn't uh, uh we didn't really add much of anything to this so question number seven what which is actually question number 23 what is the description which is which the sacred writers give of the character of deity calculated to do the lecture from the above description of the character of deity which is given him in the revelations or scriptures saying a lot of times people uh, kind of um, don't understand that that's what they're saying there in the revelations they are talking about scriptures sometimes they'll read this and they'll think oh okay so all of this is just given when i sit down and pray and it just comes you know by osmosis into my brain you know the spiritometer that's not what they're talking about here so when they say given in the revelations to man they're they're talking about the scriptures Okay, so uh, they're saying that this is given in the revelations to man. There is a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in him among every people, nation, and kindred from age to age and from generation to generation. And the answer that uh, Joseph gives here to this question that we should be staring at right now is, it is calculated to lay a foundation for the exercise of faith in him as far as the knowledge extends among all people, tongues, languages, kindreds, and nations, and then from age to age and from generation to generation, end quote. And so the answer here, the thing is, what's the, basically, what is the entire purpose of all the scriptures and, and giving this information? And so, you know, the reason why this used to be called the Doctrine and Covenants and why the Lectures on Faith were in part of it is because the reason for all of this was to help lay a foundation so that we could understand our Father in Heaven adequately enough so that we could then exercise faith in Him, which which is just an amazing concept. So um, if you could look at the Scriptures and then understand this book that I have here is, is a love letter from my Father in Heaven saying, please get to know me. Please get to know me. And, and that's why we have this. And uh, it applies to all people, all tongues, all languages, and all nations. And so um, that is the answer to that. Blake, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No. Um, perfect. Okay, so we'll go to the last one. This will be the last one. This will wrap up lecture on faith number three. And so I'll wait for it to pop up on the screen, make sure I can see it before I continue. So everyone knows that that's what I'm reading. And it hasn't popped up yet. There it is. Okay, it popped up. And here we go. The question is, is the character which God has given of himself uniform? The lecture says, let us here observe that the foregoing 
is the character which is given of God in his revelations to the former day saints. And it is also the character which is given of him in his revelations to the latter day saints. So that the saints of former days and those of latter days are both alike in this respect. The latter day saints having as good grounds to exercise faith in God as the former day saints had. Because the same character is given of him to both. Joseph's answer here is that it is. In all his revelations, whether to the former day saints, and by the former day saints we're talking about uh, saints you know, from Jesus Christ's time or even before that, um, or to the latter day saints, so that they all have the authority to exercise faith in him and to expect by the exercise of their faith to enjoy the same blessings, right? And we have to have all of those things so that we can have the faith necessary to expect these things, right? So, I mean, like, think about any of those. If God changes, it, well, could we, ex could we have confidence and expect something in him? No, because he could change. If God was a respecter of persons, would we be able to expect that from him? No, because he might like your sister more than you. If God was was quick to anger, if he got angry quick, could you expect that the reaction that you got from him would always be the same? No, because sometimes he might just snap at you. We have to understand this. We have to have this as a basis. So, and we've and, and the other thing is it's always been given so that all saints can exercise faith in their Father in heaven and expect by the exercise of their faith to enjoy the exact same blessings. Blake, did you have anything that want to add to this last one? Kind of these last two were really simple and very self-explanatory. Yeah. No, um, I I think when it comes down to it, when whenever we feel like we we see uh, um God being partial or we see God acting in different ways in different circumstances. Uh, I think first we need to look at ourselves and we need to, to look at our understanding of who God is and, and what he's um, about himself and see if maybe there's something in our, in our thinking that's, that's messed up before we go to, Oh, well, it's just God being different one day, the next, or, or loving somebody else more than another. Um, I think that's how we have to approach it. Well, brothers and sisters, I am so glad that uh, you joined us here live. And for all those who are watching this after the fact, I'm so grateful for those saints that, that want to know our Father in Heaven. Father in Heaven, hear Him. You want to hear Him. And this is what this entire thing is designed to do, to get us to understand these things so that we can hear him, so that we can exercise faith in him, so that we can know him. That's the purpose of all of this, so that so that we won't, so that we can become good learners and devote disciples and then exercise faith as the brother of Jared. We don't want to be lazy and lax this lazy learners lacks disciples and then be wandering around unable uh, to exercise even a particle of faith. No, we want to know our father. We want to be able to lay hold upon him and have confidence in him and be able to move, move mountains in his name. If he calls us to do it or build a ship, if he would rather have us do that, whatever it happens to be. I know uh, the, the church is true. And I know that these, these characteristics of God are true absolutely true i know that uh that these characteristics of, of my father in heaven are true i know that he is not a respecter of persons i know that he is full of love and compassion i know he doesn't change and the the standards do, don't change i know these things about him and and as as we live our life uh so that we can know that is in accordance with his will, a confidence and a sense of peace and serenity will overcome us as we go through the the this life, which sometimes can seem a little bit more like a nightmare than a, than a paradise. That sure anchor, that faith will enable us to, to, to get through those experiences when, when 
we should have been crushed under the weight of all of this. I know that. And I, I, I pray and commit all of us to, to once again, please read the lectures on faith. Please understand who the Father is and gain a testimony of him. And I, I share that uh, with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, Blake, uh, final words if you want, and then we'll wrap it up with a prayer. And uh, would okay. you mind saying it? Yep. Father in heaven, we thank thee for this opportunity, um, opportunity to get together as saints, um, to discuss the lectures on faith and to better understand faith and, and to better understand uh, thy character. We're grateful, Father, for revealing thy character. We're grateful for um, calling prophets to also teach these things to us so that we can understand them. Uh, we're grateful for um, those that have come here to be with us, um, those that have uh, questions, um, those that are seeking understanding. We pray that they can get that understanding. Uh, we pray, Father, that that will um, help us to... Um, to love as thou has loved and to um, be willing to to listen and to hear um, each other and and also to to exemplify thy characteristics in our own lives and we pray for these things and pray for thy spirit to continue to guide us as we um, answer these questions that others have in the name of Jesus Christ amen amen Hey, um, Fire Nice, I'm really sorry if I missed your comment. I even asked about it. I didn't I didn't see it, so I'm not trying to ignore you, and I'm definitely not trying to insult you. Um if you have a question, please put the um um the with the at the two LDS archives. So um we're not trying to ignore anyone in here and I and I try to say this at the beginning because I uh I'm terrible at looking for this stuff, so um, if you do put an at the two LDS archives, I'll try to answer it. Um, if it's something like Blacks and the Priesthood or something like that that's completely off topic, um, I'm, it, we might wait until the Q&A um, to, to address it. Like, that has happened before, um, but we, we don't intentionally try to ignore anybody, and so uh, we apologize if... if and I apologize uh, if, if that's what people are feeling. I, 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 I definitely don't try to ignore people. But if they're if they're not if there isn't a at the two LDS archives, for a lot of the time, my assumption is always that uh, that you're talking to somebody else. I, the way my screen is set up, I, I'm having to juggle between the Word document, um, Skype, and uh, the 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 YouTube, and so I, I'm not staring at uh, the live chat very well, um, and so. Full disclosure, I'm terrible at that. So if you do have anything um, insulting me, but I have several times and quit insulting me about the blacks and the priesthood. I don't. Did I miss something? We we, we should probably just move on, Mike. Okay, I think I I, I must have missed something. <laughs> I I must have missed money. I don't. I, we can we can talk about it. We can talk about it in Discord or okay. private message. Okay. Um, I I believe it was um, I believe it was Lisa that asked about that though, right? That was not Fire Nice. Yeah. Oh, my wife just came in and gave me a cold brew with uh, icicles in it. That was delicious. So. Um, we're now we'll go into the Q and A. We'll answer uh, questions that people have. Um, some questions, like uh, you know, um, well, what's the what's the list? Like uh, priestcraft, um, um, uh, priestcraft, <laughs> blacks in the priesthood. Um, oh, there's a, there's I mean there's a lot of them. We we kind Black of re e Ezra's eagle. I, I mean there, there's some that we get rehashed an awful lot. And so, um, correct, correct. Okay, so maybe that was the problem. We maybe she thought we were confusing her with Lisa. I, I definitely was not confusing with with Lisa. So, 
Okay, so if there are questions like that, in a lot of cases, we've answered them a lot. And in the Discord, it's starting to get to be that a lot of people are coming into the Discord uh, later, and they're asking the same questions. And so I, if people if people do a search or check out the pins um, in a um, in each thing, a lot of these things have already been answered. I'm trying to uh, uh, to to post people back to other uh, areas where this has been answered. So in some cases, uh, it's not that people uh, haven't answered them; it's that they've they've answered these things a, a lot. So. Um, but if, if Blake wants to talk about some of those things, I have no, I, I, I will not stop him from talking about them. But Blake has something else that we really wanted to go over in the Q&A today that was really exciting that had to do with what happened last week with um, uh, that had to do with um, uh, Ammon calling in and, um, and have, sharing his experiences and then uh, I felt prompted to ask him a question, and it turned out to be a uh, shock of shocks that it turned out to be a good thing I followed the impression because it opened up a whole avenue of, of confirmation and blessings that I, I just hadn't. I just d have been really uh, eye-opening, really eye-opening. And so um, Ammon, what a great name too, Ammon. What a great, what a great name. You know, there are certain names. Blake's another one of those names. Blake, you got a good name too. There's a. Uh, I've only known a few Blakes in my life, and oh. they've all they've all been pretty stand up guys. So there are certain there are certain names there are certain names that I worry about. But like I, I've told you, my my son Ben, every Ben I've known has has been questionable. And so when Ashley was like, "Let's name our son Benjamin," I was like, "Ah, oh, well, he's got to change. He's got to change the." Uh, the thing, but yeah, I've known I've only known a few Blakes, and they've been great, great guys. And I've only known a few Ammons, and they've all been really stand-up guys. And it and uh, it so yeah, I don't know, something weird with names. Uh, so oh, and Ammon was wait no was it Ammon or was it Topher that had the son named Blake? Uh, Topher does. Topher, it's Topher has the son named Blake, but Ammon has some kids too, right? I don't know. Now I don't know. Now I'm putting my foot in my mouth. Yeah. But Topher has the son that's named Blake. So that's a funny experience uh, uh, having a, a, a little mini Blake in the background. Um, <laughs> call him call him mini defending Zion. So that's uh, that's really cool. So anyway, so Ammon <laughs> called in last week, had a really cool experience where, where um, we re had a realization that there's an awful lot of people – with uh, promises and their patriarchal blessings, which I'm, I, did I say it right? I never say, I never say patriarchal right. Um, in their patriarchal blessings and we're having dreams dealing with a second mission. And um, I, I don't know why. And you know, another thing that we realized uh, going over this is that a lot of us had a realization that we don't know why that we ignored it. Like, that was another kind of theme of it, which is like, yeah, we just kind of, it's just, it was kind of there. And, and then we were talking about, like, I don't know why that we didn't connect this to macro last day timelines better. And wh why we didn't, you know, say, like, well, maybe this is confirmation that this is on our doorstep. But um, uh, it just kind of, the floodgates kind of open. I would say, I wouldn't say kind of, they opened last Sunday with that. And it's just been awesome. Just absolutely awesome. Blake's been getting uh, uh, the, the, the question questionnaires and things sent in people have been sharing experiences i've been getting emails and it's just been amazing uh confirmation that that brothers and sisters were in the last days and and not just oh har 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 last days i mean like the last of the last days um we are in a time period that 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 people have been promised things so specifically and people have receive dreams so specifically that all correlate and they all talk about the exact same time period we we are on the verge of the redemption of zion and the building of new jerusalem and and there we're running out of time we're running out of time 
these people are becoming 50, 60, 70 years old that, that some of which are sharing this, uh, this information and we're running out of time, right? The, 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 the promises that were, were given were so specific and the, in the blessings and the dreams are so specific that this is not something that you can write off as saying, oh, well, maybe they can die and, and do these things, you know, as a resurrected being as, or as a spirit. No, these things are so specific and, and so powerful that no, this is our, t as, um, oh man, who was it? Elder, this is our time. Nielsen, Nielsen Elder Nielsen. This is our time. This is it. And we need to get ready for it. And we need to, we need to, 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 to prepare for it because this is on our doorstep. This is on our doorstep. I, 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 I told Blake the other day, I said that, um, that I had the macro last day timeline. I had my knowledge of the scriptures and my macro last day timeline. I had uh, what I know was in my patriarchal blessing. I have what I, I know that I've experienced, uh, with, with what I've seen, what I've been praying and my wife has had a very special dream and that's been it that's all we've had um for, for for this knowledge and and over the last year the confirmation that has been poured out from on high that the the, the that this is what's happening and the world is experiencing it we have people from australia calling in people from australia that can also feel this People in Australia that are feeling this and waking up. This is not a localized event. The power of the Lamb did, descended upon the saints as they were in their scattered state. Yeah, and there are people. Hey, here's an individual right here, JSHF. I'm 64 and my blessing could not be more powerful or specific. Brothers and sisters, I have seen so many of these. Not just kind of heard, I've seen them now. That, that brothers and sisters... We're running out of time. You, the, people who want to sleep through this, we are out of time. Now, I don't believe the seventh seal is open, but I never did. I, I believe in the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. And these people's blessings and our dreams, they're all tied together. They're all correlated. And I know now now it's it, it, there's so much confirmation and so much a sense of awe that almost brings me to tears thinking about just the overwhelming amount of evidence that that has been that has come down uh to support what's happening it's just it's just overwhelming so anyway so i think this is the first time i've really heard speechless when it comes to some topic you know as far as like there's like nothing more I can say. You're just kind of like, it's overwhelming, like you said. Yeah. I I wouldn't have expected this. Like like I've said, all this stuff I knew. I know the macro last day timeline. I know this stuff, but th this is uh, we've entered a realm where I would never have, I, I I could never have expected this. I could. It, it's just it, it has exceeded already my wildest my wildest dreams. It's just. I can I this fills me with so much like if this is what's happening now brothers and sisters what can, what, can you not imagine what it's going to be like when the pillar of fire and the cloud can you not imagine th these things that are going to bring people to their knees and cause their knees to shake and tremble as the, the Lord's voice is uttered forth from his camp I mean it, it, it is uh, just beyond the pale uh, in coincidence it is just so f we've so far past that that it, it, yeah it's just it's it's awestruck it's just it, it's just a miracle i'm watching a modern miracle and it brings me to a, such a sense of awe that that i wonder i don't know how how i can't even imagine how wonderful uh these things are going to experience when it talks about in the scriptures that that you know they're filled with the ever the songs of everlasting joy and i think okay maybe that's just kind of a cliche i think uh oh what's his bucket uh, it discord always makes fun of me with the uh the kumbaya and daniel daniel i th you know i think there's you daniel. know yeah daniel and i think like oh, okay yeah sings songs of kumbaya but then it's like you experience something like this and you're like that's gonna happen 
Like, like when these these amazing things start happening, you, the the sense of fire in us and love and people will not be able to contain the the songs of of joy and everlasting, um, of uh, the songs of, of just joy and happiness to to be able to witness these things. And so I, I've I've gained a. a unbelievable personal testimony of that this week that w there will be songs sung daniel there will be kumbaya there there will be hand holding that will happen uh, i've i've gained a testimony of that very personally this week so i'll, I'll just um um how do i keep myself from rolling my eyes so, well see that's the thing i i don't keep myself from rolling my eyes that's my problem so maybe you can ask blake that blake's much better at biting his tongue um <laughs> that that is definitely one of my uh my weaknesses biting my tongue i'm very loyal and i'm very quick to defend people especially people that uh i believe are being are trying to be good people and so uh you might want to I want to ask Blake about biting your tongue. I would absolutely roll my eyes and I would audibly groan. And then when everyone looked at me, I would go, does anybody want to know the truth? So um, <laughs> that's that's what I would do in that situation. All right, Ben, or, uh, Blake, we'll pass it over to you and uh, you can uh, let us know what you found. Okay. So... As we go through this, um, you're going to you're going to hear things um, that may spark some thoughts or some memories in yourself. I want you to recognize that as the spirit reminding you of of these impressions and these revelations you've received for your own life. Um, I'd also encourage you after you listen to this, whatever, like write down those impressions, write down those things. So many people that contacted me said, I, I remember these little details or that. And, you know, some even express like, man, I wish I would have recorded this. I wish I would have journaled this. And there was that regret. And definitely when we receive spiritual impressions, um, when we receive dreams and we know that they're from God, we should be recording these things, um, not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of our posterity. So to start out with, that's that's what I'll say. Also, if there is uh, if there's questions that come up as I'm talking about this, please put those questions in there because I, I felt as I was preparing this information that there was going to be other questions come up about these experiences that people might have that may lead us to some further insight as well. So please ask those questions. Okay. So first to give you some statistics, um, what I did was I just, uh, anybody that wanted to could message me or email me if, if they had had a second, uh, a dream about a second mission, serving a second mission. Um, so there was 34 so far people that, uh, total people that responded to my request. Of those 34, uh, five of them were women and 29 were men. And I do have strong reason to believe that there are many, many more people that have experienced this but um, it lies dormant in them um, that maybe they've forgotten it. Uh, maybe they haven't written it down. So I think as, as this goes forward, we'll start seeing more people sharing these similar experiences and dreams. Now, I, I asked specifically about second missions, but there were individuals who had not served missions before that had these dreams of serving missions um, to two people in particular um, of those 34. Now, all but those two. Oh. Oh. Serving as a young man or as a young woman. Okay, so hey, Blake. this was clearly a second mission, um, a, a mission apart from the proselyting mission they had already served. Also interesting 
is that there was no clear generational divide in who had these dreams. Um, there were boomers that had these dreams. There were Gen Y, Gen X, millennials, all of these um, different generations had these dreams. And again, men and women had them. Okay, so first to go through a little bit of the doctrine to kind of set up why I believe these dreams are divinely inspired. Um, Joseph Smith said in a letter to um, Isaac Galland uh, that's found in the Times and Seasons that we believe that we have a right to revelations, visions, and dreams from God, our heavenly. Oh, I think Blake Blake just disconnected himself. Oh. Hello. Hey, I don't know why you got cut off. All right, you just you just read that uh, Joseph Smith uh, taught that we had the right to revelation and uh, dreams. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me finish that quote. Um, or I'll just read it again. Okay. So we believe we have the right to revelations, visions, and dreams from God, our Heavenly Father, and light and intelligence through the gift of the Holy Ghost on all subjects pertaining to our spiritual welfare, if it so be that we keep his commandments so as to render ourselves worthy in his sight. Uh, George A. Smith said, when a man's mind is illuminated by a dream, it leaves a vivid and pleasant impression. When it may be guided by the Spirit of God, it leaves the mind happy and comfortable and the understanding clear. Okay, so why do I think these dreams were divinely inspired? Um, first of all, there's some some details in the dream, in in many of these dreams, not all dreams, but many of them, that that show that they came from God and not from a deceptive or an impure source. Um, many people reported having a guide or a companion in their dream, and that guide or companion either went with them or gave them their call or was just present together with them in the dream. And this actually matches perfectly with other dreams and visions in scripture where there's a guide or a companion present. Um, Lehi, Nephi, John the Revelator all experienced this. Um, in very few of these dreams also were there any representations of evil things or, or evil ideas or anything connected to evil. Um, for those that did experience evil in their dream, it was more something that they were charged with overcoming, avoiding, or combating, or which was uh, something that had to do with a specific task that they had in their in their mission that they were called to. Uh, for some people, these dreams began dur either during or right after they served their mission or they got home from their mission. Um, for others, these dreams have only begun recently, many, many years after they've served. Um, so for those that have started that started having them after their mission, um, I know some people expressed that maybe they felt like, well, that's just where they were at in their life. They were thinking about missionary work. And so that's naturally what you dream about. But the fact that these people continue to have these dreams um, for many years later after the mission suggests that it wasn't just a circumstance of their of the time that they were in, but it actually suggests that it was a, a an understanding and unfolding of a revelation about their future and about what their entire life calling and their entire life mission was. Uh, the major focus or purpose of these dreams was to help people to understand their purpose or their mission was to preach the gospel. Okay, So while the focus um, of the dreams was about sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel as a, as a missionary, uh, there were other aspects of their mission that they came to understand besides that. So there were other things that they that they did in the dreams 
that weren't necessarily preaching the gospel, but that was the general gist of their dream. And in that in that sense, the the purpose of their dream or the understanding it gave them was very specific. Um, another aspect to these dreams that suggests they are divinely given are the, pe- the people, uh, most everyone had these dream had multiple dreams of this of this being called. And sometimes these dreams recurred over a period of 10 to 15 years. So for quite a long time. Uh, for some, you know, in each dream, different aspects of their mission were highlighted. For others, it seemed like it was a natural progression uh, where they learned a little bit more about their mission each time they dreamed. And for those um, that did only experience this dream once, which there were some that did, um, their de- their dreams were sufficiently detailed enough to really give them the revelation that the Lord wanted them to have. So this idea of repetition um, really is a spiritual principle that the Lord uses. Um, Elder Bednar taught that repetition is a vehicle through which the Holy Ghost can enlighten our minds, influence our hearts, and enlarge our understanding. Okay, so the idea there's repetition suggests these are from God. Now, we also have to realize the truth, too, that the Lord can and does give us inspiration or series of impressions regarding future callings or missions in life. And President Eyring taught this in the last general conference. Um, I love to see the temple. He talks about some of these experiences he had where he received these impressions about his future and which in reality came about in his life. Um, in particular, I thought it was interesting, you know, a lot of people focused on um, his phrase uh, that President Kimball gave to him and his wife, to live so that when the call comes, you can walk away easily. Uh, a lot of people I know after that, we talked about it, thought, oh, man, that's New Jerusalem, right? That's that's the call, right? The call to go. And then, you know, myself and, and others, I think, as we've lit, heard these dreams and, and pondered on them, we've realized that the call it could be these 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 missions right these missions that were given that we do need to be prepared to walk away easily and in particular in his talk he said this it was a call to leave what seemed an idyllic family situation to serve in an assignment in a place that i knew nothing about so Definitely the Lord can and does reveal um, our future mission to us. And I, I firmly believe I have a testimony that these are our future missions. Um, these are things that will come to pass, um, just as sure as the things that are promised in our patriarchal blessings. Okay. So now, is there a connection between the lineages of people and the content of these dreams. Meaning, um, is there anything we can surmise from who's having these dreams and why they might be having them? So um, I asked just simply, I didn't ask specifically to say, hey, tell me what tribe specifically you're from. I just asked, are you um, of the tribe of Joseph or Ephraim or Manasseh? That's what I asked. And everyone that responded said yes. Everyone, okay? Now, one of the blessings or the responsibilities that's given to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, um, that's given in Deuteronomy 33, is to push together the house of Israel to the ends of the earth. So they are the gathering tribes in this last dispensation. Um, And as I mentioned before, everybody that responded said that in their dreams, their primary purpose of their mission was to preach the gospel or to gather scattered Israel. So to me, it makes perfect sense why the Lord would reveal these duties to those of of these tribes. Now, I hope that, you know, if you're an individual that's listening to this, that 
isn't of one of those tribes or you haven't had one of these dreams, don't think that the Lord doesn't expect or doesn't have uh, similar expectations or, or plans for you in the future. Like I said, some people have only recently had these dreams. And so it may be that you just haven't had this dream yet, or you haven't had that impression or revelation yet. But I promise you, it's coming. Um, the The concert of clarity on this is crystal clear. Okay, so to go back, why would the Lord use dreams to reveal uh, these things to those that are of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh? Well, as we go through the scriptures, um, and as we go through church history also, we actually see a consistent pattern of those of the tribe of Joseph, of Ephraim, Manasseh, receiving revelations in dreams regarding their future responsibilities or their future callings. So the fact that people are having these dreams um, and the circumstances um, surrounding their lives matches actually really well with what the revealed word says. So. Obviously, the best example is Joseph in Egypt, right? In Genesis 37, he has two dreams in which he sees his brothers and sisters and his parents, um, the, the sheaves, right, making obeisance to him, um, signaling to him what's in his future as far as um, his, pu his future mission, calling, and how that's going to relate to his family. Um we also see that he give, he's given the ability to interpret dreams, especially the dreams of others. And, you know, he likely received these interpretations of the dreams of the, the, the baker and the butcher because it dealt with him. And he needed to, ha to know that interpretation in order to be able to fulfill his future callings or responsibilities. The same thing with Pharaoh and his dreams. It was Pharaoh that had the dream, but it was Joseph that got the interpretation. And why was it that he got it? Because those specific things that were happening pertained directly to Joseph's mission and what he was supposed to do, which was, was to gather the house of Israel and to save them temporally and spiritually. Um, the example of Gideon. Gideon has a dream um, and in the dream, all he's told is, get up, and you're going to get an answer about what my intentions are by going out among the people. So he goes and he does that, and he happens to overhear a man tell a dream that he had. And then there's another man that's standing next to there that says, that's the interpretation of your dream. And then Gideon hears this, and the Lord's like, boom. Boom. The interpretation of that dream is exactly what's going to, what I'm going to do for you, Gideon, and what, what I intend to do for you. And so here, you know, Gideon himself was of the tribe of Manasseh. Um, his 300 men were likely composed of some of Manasseh. And so we see these tribes, these people, having these experiences with dreams and their future callings and their missions. Um, not to belabor the point, but Lehi, he has dreams uh, where he sees, uh, he, you know, he's given a book and said, read it. And then he goes, you know, he, he goes forth and, you know, he, he says things to Jerusalem um, and, and does things. And then in his life, he goes forth and he fulfills those things. Um, and remember, Lehi was of the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, the prophet Joseph Smith he had many dreams pertaining to his future callings and responsibilities as a member of the house of Joseph, and he was of the tribe of Ephraim. Okay, so Micah, how are we doing? Are there questions so far that you've seen that maybe we should stop and answer? Um, no, I'm not. Um, seeing any real questions here, scrolling down. I think people are talking to themselves mostly. Okay. Um, Fire and okay. Ice says here at the end, Satan has been sending fake dreams to those trying to force 
themselves into being something special. Yeah. Um, that's, that's definitely, that's definitely a possibility. Um, and we've seen, yeah, cases where that's happened, where people yep. may have these dreams, but then they, they take, they take pride in themselves and, uh, and believe that, you know, the Lord's asking them to do things, um, that they're not really, um, supposed to do. And I think Blake, uh, was, so when part of, oh. part of my... Well, yeah, part of my um go ahead uh, what Blake just went over um I just dropped my mic too um what Blake just went over with with why these people were receiving dreams um it has to coincide with the keys of of revelation and it won't supersede the the keys above us and so that's another that's another big key and I think that's why Blake was going over this first. You're never like you have the examples of Daybell, um, J.R. Jody Stoddard. Um, that's what you said here. Um, when you have, when people have dreams that supersede their rights of revelation, um, you can autom you automatically know that it, it's not from God. And so, um, it's really important to understand the the rights and the keys associated with that re revelation that will be directly tied uh, to those and what you're allowed to see and not see in a dream. And so, and I, I believe Blake did a relatively good job of, of, of going over that. And I think he's still going to keep going, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way I structured the way I, um, had people approach me and then answer the questions was I, I first, like, I, I just asked if, if people had these experiences and if they felt like they wanted to share things, right. They were more than welcome to do that if they felt prompted to. Um, so I wasn't putting that expectation on people. And I also wasn't introducing until they, sh after they shared, I wasn't introducing any ideas or similarities um, or any of these principles that I've been going over as to taint, taint the process, right? I didn't want them to be like, oh yeah, I, I experienced the same thing too, right? I wanted it to be genuine and I wanted it to be from the heart. So. What I did was I first, I listened, right? I listened to people share these things as much as they were willing to share with no expectations that they would share everything. And then after they did that, I, I had that questionnaire that I sent out, um, again, just asking general questions and uh, not asking for specifics. And and with even those general questions, uh, the patterns manifested themselves. And again, it was these people just sharing the experiences they had. It wasn't me saying, oh, you experienced this, right? You know, as, as kind of a, a leading question, right? I wasn't doing that. Um, and the confirmation really came in, in their answers and some of the things, some of the, the patterns and the themes that I saw. So, okay. Now I think a big question everybody has about these these dreams is is there any consistent pattern with when these second missions would occur? So like where on the timeline would this occur in our future? Okay. So almost everybody that dreamed that they were uh, called to serve a second mission in the same mission that they served previously had served in North America, somewhere Canada or the United States, or they had served in Central America somewhere, or they had served in South America somewhere. Okay. So there was, there was nobody that um, had served somewhere else outside of those areas that then had um that then served in those areas in the second mission or in some other area outside of north central or south america okay so the geographic area was very defined in where people were serving now there were some people that had these dreams that previously had not served in North, Central, or South America. 
And either through the fact that they had multiple dreams or because the Lord specifically re- revealed details about it, these people did gain a revelation about specific locations that they would serve. Even specific cities. And the truly amazing part is that all of those, every single one of them, were in North America, Central America, or South America. Okay? So this this wasn't just a coincidence that, oh, all these people happen to serve their first missions in, in these areas, and the Lord's telling them they're going to serve again, right? In, in that same area. No, this is, they're going to serve in these areas. And if they didn't serve in those areas before, they will serve in these areas in the future. So is there anything in the revealed word that suggests that there is to be a period of gathering in these areas or in these locations? And yes, there is. Um, in Third Nephi chapter 21, Uh, Verses 23 and 24, we read, And they, meaning the converted Gentiles, shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob. And the remnant of Jacob, if if you've studied this, means those of Ephraim and Manasseh. And also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem. And then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in who are scattered upon all the face of the land in unto the new Jerusalem. Okay, so in these verses, the Lord's referencing a gathering that is yet future from where we are now. And it's going to take place concurrent with and after the new Jerusalem has begun to be established. And the primary people that are involved in this gathering are the converted Gentiles, who many of them are Ephraim and Manasseh. It will be the remnant of Jacob, who also, again, includes those of Ephraim and Manasseh. And it will include others that are of the tribe of of uh, other tribes of the house of Israel. Now, of these three groups, the remnant of Jacob is really the one that is involved in this. It, It is Ephraim and Manasseh that is involved in this gathering. Um, Orson Pratt is a second witness of this. Um, He said, A great many, without reading these things, have flattered themselves that we are the ones who are going to do all this work. It is not so. We have got to be the helpers. We have got to be those who cooperate with the remnants of Joseph in accomplishing this great work. Do not misunderstand me. Do not think that all the Lamanite tribes are um, going to be converted and receive this great degree of education and civilization before we can return to Jackson County. Do not think this for a moment. It will only be a remnant. For when we have laid the foundation of that city and have built a portion of it and have built a temple therein, there is another work which we have got to do in connection with these remnants of Jacob, whom we shall assist in building the city. What is it? We have got to be sent forth as missionaries to all parts of this American continent not to the Gentiles, for their times will be fulfilled. But we must go to all those tribes that roam through the cold regions of the north, British America, Canada, to all the tribes that dwell in the territories of the United States, also to all those who are scattered through Mexico and Central and South America. And the object of our going will be to declare the principles of the gospel unto them, and bring them to a knowledge of the truth. That's the end of the quote. So where is this going to happen? This is going to happen in connection with with the New Jerusalem after it's established um, or in conjunction with its establishment. So as Mike has said, and and I'll, I'll be a second witness to this, we are so close. We, I mean... Like I said, there was there was people that are in the in the boomer generation, older generations that were having these dreams of serving these missions. And while there is the possibility that yes, maybe these missions may have been 
um, after they died, um, there's also the very real possibility that they would still be mortal um, when the, when these dreams occurred. And for that to take place and for them to be able to have the, the physical strength and stamina to be able to do this, um, you know, at, at the ages that they are approaching, it has to be close. It has to be close. Um, we're, we're butting up, as Mike has said before, that we're butting up to that time where either the prophecies of God and these dreams are going to be fulfilled literally, or we're going to have to find some other way to make it all work and, and to, to not make it so that God's a liar, basically. These have, these have to be fulfilled. Um, so, so for me, that was a huge, that was a huge confirmation of what I had experienced personally, but also, uh, again, a concert of clarity um, that the Lord through these dreams is showing us about this particular part of the gathering and what's, what's going to occur and, and, and when it's going to occur. Isn't it? Isn't it just perfect too? Like it is just, it, it it's exactly what happens next in the macro last day timeline. It, it, we have the redemption, uh, the open return of Joseph Smith. We have the redemption of Zion. We have the initial building of it, and then we have what? Then we have exactly what it talks about: missionaries and where in North and South America, gathering people in and unto the New Jerusalem and. Everyone's having dreams of second missions that are either going to be taking place in the same place that they served in North and South America, or if they never, if they didn't serve in North and South America before, this time they are. And we're gathering people in and unto the New Jerusalem during this time period. That 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 is, uh, and and by the way, this takes place um, before the ten tribes have returned. This takes place before the 10 tribes return. Therefore, this takes place before the 144,000 uh, or, or are ordained and set and set up. And so this, this would represent what? This would represent the last days of the fishers of men. This would represent the last of those days. This would represent Jacob chapter 5. Go ye therefore one last time, get everyone and bring them in. So this is uh, this is the last time that, that, that that's going to happen. And then when we have the return of the 10 tribes, the 144,000, and then that uh, missionary force gets turned into hunters of men. And so, um, yeah, so that, that is exactly what, what we're supposed to have uh, 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 next. And, you know, something that uh, while we're talking about dreams, well, we had Brett um, share a dream that he had and, and and everyone knows and and Matt knows this. I'm not a I'm not a huge dream sharer. I'm just I'm not. I'd rather talk about the doctrine. But when this came up, it, it, it just it, and everyone said, "Oh wow!" Raised their hand and said, "We've had this all this. We've had the same dream." It it was beyond the point of coincidence, and it had to be talked about. And we had to understand where this fit in the fits in the macro last day timeline. But what I was going to say about Brett's dream is that Brett's dream was about the redemption of Zion. Uh, the people going in, the angels, the cloud, the protection, and the area being leveled. But uh, the important part of what Brett's dream that he said uh, at the end was that people then began to start leaving. Some stayed because he knew that they were going to take part in the building of the center stake of Zion, but others left because he said that he knew they had missions to do. And once again, that confirms exactly the same macro last day timeline, and it confirms the same series of events. That there will be a redemption of Zion, some will stay behind and start the initial building, the rest of the church, we have the uh, the callings of, of missions and missionaries to gather people in and unto the new Jerusalem at that time. And so, and once again, when we've talked about these dreams, nobody, nobody is claiming um, to um, be leading these people, right? Uh, 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 Blake didn't mention that in his uh, assessment, but that was one of the things too, is that we were all called by a prophet. That, that was, and, and, and he didn't mention that. What percentage of people said that they, that they were called to do it? 
Um, it, everybody said they were called, and it was interesting because some were called like they didn't know which prophet it was. For some, like they they kind of realized like it was the prophet, and it was a specific prophet, but it wasn't uniform in which prophet. But it was everybody experienced kind of that feeling of it, it came from God. It came from God's authorized servant. And that and that's important. So so nobody here is claiming, like there there is no call out uh, occurring here. Wherever it's every man for himself. This is a confirmation that when th that there will come a point in time that the keys, right? Not Blake, not Micah, not any of us. We're not saying that that there will come a point in time when the keys, when Joseph Smith, uh, whoever the keys were at that time, um, say go out and do this. Um, that that this is a this is a response to a call, and at that point in time we will and and as Blake said earlier in this, President uh, Iring said, "Live your life so that when that call comes, that you can go and you can do it, that you can leave and do it." And you know the other thing that was really interesting about that is that he said, even though you might seem like an idyllic life, and I think, wow, wouldn't that be the new Jerusalem? Like, you've just taken part in the redemption of, yeah. of Zion. You've just taken part in the redemption of Zion. And it's like, I want to be here so bad. I want to help build this. And then the call comes, no, you need to get out there and help people. And you need to live your life so that you're ready for both of these calls. So you're ready to to, to, to forego the luxuries uh, of, of living in that beautiful city, the New Jerusalem, for a time. So that you can go to a what do you say a strange place or a foreign place? Yeah. And uh, a and, place and, you didn't know anything about. That's right, a place yeah. you didn't know anything about, and you can do this. And um, I believe in the literal fulfillment of scriptures, and I, I know that we haven't reached that point in time yet. I, I that where where the literal fulfillments can't happen. In the next ten years, yeah, all of a sudden we have some problems, right? There are some sixty-year-olds that have things promised in their patriarchal blessings that, when they're seventy or eighty, all of a sudden it, it, it becomes, I, I don't know how you're gonna, I don't know how this is gonna be fulfilled literally. I, I just, I just don't. Um, in in ten years, the the prophecy of the rising generation, Talmage's prophecy, um, the uh, desolating sickness tied to the, the generation. I, I mean, uh, there are flat out prophecies not just micah's interpretations of them flat out prophecies by by joseph smith talmage and others um that will be that will be utterly wasted if these things don't happen and i i believe in the literal fulfillment of these things so i i you know like people always ask me what happens if it doesn't happen well i'll cross that bridge when it happens but at this time uh i can't live my life what right tying this back to lectures on faith I can't live my life thinking that there might be variableness with the Lord. I can't do that. I have to live my life believing that there is no variableness and that this is going to happen exactly how the Lord said it was going to happen in exactly the way the Lord said it was going to happen. And uh, so that that means, yes, the, uh, the open return of Joseph Smith, the uh, redemption of Zion, and then new missions. And what was it? I, and now I'm forgetting. Was it uh, Stevenson or Christ Christofferson uh, at the uh, fireside? Christofferson um, said that the the work of gathering in the next generation is going to be a lot different. Um, it's uh, and I believe Kim did a wonderful uh, uh, um, transcription of that uh, of that talk that he gave there because it might be taken down off the website in two weeks. It says. But uh, he said that, that we're going to enter a new period that they don't know what it's going to look like. And um, I, I, I believe that this is what it is. This is the, the new gathering that, 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 that's going to take place after the redemption of Zion and the building of New Jerusalem. And so um, that's what I believe. And, and I'm just so, so great, grateful for the chance to hear everyone confirm what I've what that everyone is experiencing the I exact same thing and and are willing to share their their share this with us you know i i just i i'm humbled by it yeah so a, a few other things i, I kind of wanted to share to 
kind of answer some questions about these. Um, and first of all, the, the fact that women um, also had these dreams as well, you know, what does that really mean for them? Because I think we, we understand like, okay, well, you know, the proclamation of the family, uh, their primary responsibility is to, to nurture their children, raise their children, right? And the women that have these dreams, um, you know, some of them, they still have children at home, right? Or they will have children at home for the, for the foreseeable future. So what does this mean for them? Um, as I pondered on this, thought about this, and again, this isn't to say this is, this is the revelation that they need to accept. This isn't the interpretation that they should accept, but just to kind of get them thinking about what this means for them. Um, you know, the, the, rim, the, the women that had these dreams, um, like I said, most all of them had already served missions. And um, it's important to understand that women, just like men, have been given the charge by President Nelson to gather Israel. And so, especially if you're of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, part of your divine mission in life is to assist in the gathering of Israel. President Nelson said, that is the mission for which you were sent to this earth to fulfill. Okay? And this gathering isn't solely done by the priesthood. Okay? You don't have to be a holder of the priesthood to participate in the gathering. The second thing is that every single person, everybody, mentioned that there was a realization, whether it was in the dream or later, that the circumstances of them being called on a mission again really were a contradiction to um, current church policy of calling missionaries meaning that right now it is not policy of the church for you know middle-aged uh, couples to serve missions it's it's not common uh, policy for a woman that still has children at home to go and serve a mission so there was this contradiction that people had to deal with in their minds about okay well this is the dream i had where i was going and i did have a family at home and i did have children and so there's this realization that changes changes may be coming, right? There, there, there would need to be a change in the policy for these to take place. This isn't to say that, that this, this is us receiving that revelation, because the prophets, they have to receive that revelation. They have to receive that direction for the church. There's also the possibility that I think we have to be open to that personal situations or family situations for these women may actually allow it for them to be able to serve. Uh, whether that's um, a spouse dying or whether that's um, because of the New Jerusalem being established, um, others staying with that, those children while, while others go out. In my mind, I think those are those are things that we have to consider potentially. I'm not saying that that's specifically what's going to happen in each case, but but it's a possibility. Um, and there's been a lot of women so, that have been getting dreams or impressions that they're going to take part in the gathering via their home, and so there might be people sent off to gather people in and under the New Jerusalem. But guess what? We have to walk from point A to point B. And so we might need homes and, 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 and places of safety from point A to point B. And, uh, you know, these people that are have these women that are having these dreams that I need to make my home safe, I need to be ready to do this, absolutely would be integral to, to the part of that gathering. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And uh, Reba, she mentions too in, in the chat that uh, maybe they are are also going with their husband or their family, and that somehow in the way that you know the New Jerusalem society is structured, that it would allow for that. Yes, that that's a possibility as well. So, um, trying to think if there's anything anything else that I've any other theme. Um, 
I don't know. For me, I just I was I was just so grateful um, for people that that were willing to share these experiences with me. Um, I've done nothing to to gain that trust. I've done nothing to to be that 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 source, I guess, that people would look to, you know, for for confirmation or whatever. And so for people to just like trust me with these things is is amazing. And and I will keep them sacred and I won't share them or the details of them with others. Um, but but having this experience has taught me that um, the Lord's giving us all the same message in our each in our individual circumstances. And, you know, he's preparing us so that we'll be ready. Um, I know Charles, you know, in the chat, he mentioned that there may be some that feel that they aren't ready, that they aren't prepared um, for, for these things. Um, I didn't get the impression from any of these, these dreams that anybody was prepared for these things. Um, as far as knowing how to be a missionary, like they understood that, but as far as like every, all their ducks being in a row and ready to leave and to, to serve this mission, I don't think anybody, I was under the illusion that that was easy or was going to be easy. I think everybody realized that there was something, some sort of sacrifice that they would be called to make to, to be able to do these things. And you know, like I said, if, if, if you haven't, if you haven't had these experiences or these dreams yet, don't, don't get down on yourself and don't think that the Lord doesn't have um, intentions for you and for your life. It does depend a lot on whether you're willing to hear him and whether you're willing to obey him. Um, the Lord can only use you as an instrument as you're willing to, to mold to his hands um, to, to be used by him. Um, and so having that, that teachableness, that, that humility to be able to accept what the Lord is telling you um, is, is crucial. And in that sense, I think that there'll be, there'll be people that just are unwilling to do that. And so the Lord can't use them um, because of the, their choices. Um, but it will require sacrifices and and it will yield forth amazing, amazing blessings as we do this. Um, so yeah, that's that's my testimony that uh, that these dreams are divinely inspired. And if if anybody that is listening to this has a desire to to reach out again to me, like I'll still be open um, to to listening. Um, I'm sure Micah, he probably would feel the same. And, uh, and remember too, that it's, it's the Lord that you need to go through to for the interpretations of these things. Um, these are just themes that we noticed in everybody's dreams, but the interpretation lies with God and God can reveal it to us individually, um, in our own lives. Um, you have that right to be able to do that in your own life. And um, so for what it means for you personally, uh, especially, you know, for women, I think there's a lot of soul searching and questions that need to go to the Lord to ask, you know, what that means. And um, I know that he'll reveal those things to you. Um, I know he'll give you he'll give you enough of a vision to where you can you can, you know, you can act in faith where it still requires faith for you to act. And that as you do that, then, then you'll, you'll see them more clearly. You'll see things more clearly. You'll feel things more clearly. Yeah, and that's my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll just, we'll wrap this up. Uh, Reba just says here that I think it's more important that we are willing. And I just like to end on that, that what, uh, what uh, Blake was saying there and end on this concept that, we're blessed according to our desires. We're blessed according to our willingness. And um, I, don't, I don't think that it's any coincidence. I don't think it's any coincidence. And I might be going out on the limb here, but I'm, you know, people who know me know I'm willing to do that. 
I don't believe it's any coincidence that in in my dreams when I was having these, I was always willing. I was always willing. And I, because of that willingness, God knew that, I, well, Micah might be rough around the edges. Micah might not know everything. Micah might be a, you know, all these horrible things, but Mike is willing. And because of that, he got me on YouTube and he got me out in COVID because he knew that, well, you know what? Uh, Micah might not be the best fit, but he's at least willing. And I don't think there's a coincidence between that and also what happened, tying this back to last week with Ammon. Ammon just started his YouTube channel. He just started it. And what did he say just happened last week in his dream? He finally said yes. He finally said, yes, I am willing. I, I know that there is a connection between desire and willingness and these things moving forward. And, and it's it's gone over painfully throughout the entire Book of Mormon and then capstoned with Moroni's promise at the end that if you want to know the truth of all things, you have to have real desire, sincere heart, uh, sincere heart and faith, faith in the Lord. If you don't have that, that real intent or that willingness, if you don't have that desire, you're not going to have the, the, the next things. They're not just going to come to you. You have to have the desire. Yea, Lord, I will go and, and where you want me to go and I will do what you want me to do. We have to have that first. We have to. God does not begin by asking our ability, only our availability. And when we prove our dependability, he increases our capability. It's one of the wonderful quotes from Neil A. Maxwell. And I, and I know that, that, that that's a, a true principle, that we need to have that willingness. We need to have that willingness. I love the church and I love all of you and I'm grateful for the confirmation that, that this is, I, I didn't come on YouTube because of confirmation. I didn't come on to set myself up as a light. I don't care about that stuff, but man, it, it, has that blessing uh, been miraculous in my life to, to, to have the overwhelming sense of confirmation um, from people's personal revelation, their patriarchal blessings and, and all of this. It's, it, it's overwhelming. And so um, brothers and sisters, wake up, get your life in order, get the faith that you need. And, and like I've said, brothers and sisters, if we need, if you, if, this is the time to prove that we can at least squeeze out a couple years of our life, just a couple years of our life. Can we, can we get our life together? Can we have faith in the savior for just a couple years? Can we do that for just a couple years? And I can promise you that you're going to start to see more and more and more of these things happen and you will be eternally grateful for just sticking it out and having that uh, um, that gump, that that determination, just to get your life in order and get right in this time period. We need to do it now. I love you, and um, I guess in closing, I would say here that I provided Blake's. Um, email address in the description box of the video if you would like to join uh the saints uh discord send blake an email and he will uh give you an invite to that god bless godspeed keep the faith we'll talk to you again uh very soon